Hey there, welcome to my channel. My name is Najwa. If it's your first time here, a big welcome. I would love to invite you to check out my new book, Millennial and Gen Z Guide to Marriage, Love in the Age of Lies, Deception, and Mistrust. It's available on Amazon, it's available on Audible, on iTunes. You can buy it as an audiobook, you can buy it as a paperback, um, you can buy it as a Kindle. If you have the Kindle, I use my Kindle a lot and I just explore the pitfalls the ups and downs of marriage, especially millennial and Gen Z marriage, is not always so easy. Many of us are deciding not to get married and I think that we should. I think that we should really take a look and know that that love out there is for us. I walk you through all of the ups and downs of my dating life and what I learned along the way, what brought me to marrying someone who was basically my complete opposite, you know, black Southern American woman and a white European kind of dorky man, you know, and it just, it worked out. He's analytical, I'm creative, and we went through all of this stuff, going through bringing our families together and, uh, you know, societal pressures and differences and, um, how we wanted to carry out our marriage and differences of communication, uh, journeys with our mental health and uh, finance, and starting a business and running a home. It all came in there. It all came in there. In-laws, it's all in there. You can learn about, you know, the challenges that come with marriage, but the richness that you gain from it. And uh, it's really a survival guide, but it's also a journal. Um, and you might see some of yourself reflected in there. And if you aren't a millennial or a Gen Z, you can still check out the book. You might love to share it with someone who you might know in your life. So like I said, uh, Millennial and Gen Z Guide to Marriage, Love in the Age of Lies, Deception and Mistrust by Nedra Ferreira. It is on Amazon, it's on iTunes, it is on Audible. I would love for you to check it out and let me know what you think of it. I want to hear what you think. Let's discuss it. And I'm here for it. I'm here for it. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Hello, welcome to my channel. I'm so happy you're here. If you are new here, I would love for you to do me a favor. Hit the like and subscribe button. Hit the bell. Let's get into it, guys. It's the real natural. We got a lot to talk about here. We're going to talk about Princess Kate out of Great Britain. Her cancer diagnosis was really shocked to hear about that. We're going to talk about Wendy Williams documentary. Guys, please don't look at my hands. I feel like I'm having that moment like that Tyler Perry meme. COVID is still out there and I'm still, you know, um, a little bit sus about it. Not everybody washes their hands. Not everybody be washing their booty and their mouth. And anyway, we're going to talk about Halle Bailey. Halle Bailey, we love you. MSNBC firing Mehdi Hassan. No, I haven't forgotten. We're going to talk about uh, why is TV and, and movies, why, why do they suck so much today? Have you guys ever gone back, for those of you who are millennials and Gen Z like me, you probably go back and watch early 2000s movies, TV shows that you, you used to like back in the day, and you're like, why can't movies be like they were back then? If you're from the Gen Y or Baby Boomer generation, maybe you go back and look at movies from more like the 90s and the 80s and the 70s, and you ask, oh my god, why even the 60s, why can't movies be like they were back in the day? Uh, I have a theory on that, so let's talk about that. Um, um, we're going to talk about Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk, he just, uh, he's in another world. He's in another world. Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, his interview with Don Lemon. Just, I, Don Lemon is out there exposing these people and they hate him forward. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, Jamie Foxx is back. Guys, black people, take care of yourself. I am convinced right now that we are getting spiritual burnout, physical burnout. And we just, I mean, I'm so glad he's back in the game. But look at how many young people are experiencing heart issues and health issues and stroke and cancer and all these things that, you know, just a previous generation, a generation previous didn't have to deal with. Maybe it's because of this stressful um, political and social climate that we live in. So we're going to talk about Jamie Foxx being back. He's kicking some butt with Cameron Diaz. He was recently spotted on a film set um, with Cameron Diaz. And Cameron Diaz, we're also going to talk about her new baby. She just welcomed a new baby at the ripe young age of 51. I'm like, go girl. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's that actually one is kind of close to my heart. We'll talk about that when I'll explain why that's a little close to my heart. 
Um, I, I had been really rooting for Cameron Diaz to just, because for so many years she was, you know, dating these loser guys and single and, you know, I was really rooting for her to find her one. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Biden-Harris campaign getting it in, shout it. It is getting, I got to put a little Atlanta on you. And lastly, uh, oh, no, so that's it. Okay, guys, so let's get into it. So we have a lot to talk about here. Let's start with Princess Kate's uh, cancer diagnosis. I'm going to start with that because I know a lot of people come to my channel for my thoughts on um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. I'm a big supporter of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And um, we need to talk about this for a second. So Princess Kate and the people who are just like I, absolutely bored and have nothing to do with their life. They'll run up on my channel and they'll be like, her name is not Princess Kate, it's Catherine, uh, Princess Catherine, the prin Princess of Wales, or whatever. Um, they'll come on and say, hey, Meghan, Prince Meghan Markle is not a princess. Whatever, guys. I'm not friggin' British. I'm American. You know, friggin' Cinderella and Snow White and Golden Slippers. They're friggin' princesses, okay? Anyway, for, I'm going to use Princess Kate, okay? It's easier for me than pulling out this whole whatever title you guys want me to put out. Um, I was shocked to hear this. A lot of people who support Princess Meghan and, and Prince Harry, um, they are sort of kind of taking the blame right now, taking shots. People are taking shots at the people who support Prince Harry and Meghan because somehow Princess Kate has cancer, you know? And I just feel like this is the moment to set all that stuff aside because, I mean, there are going to be, okay, there are going to be some squatty people out there with, I mean, people who support Prince Harry and Meghan Markle who, I mean, probably think that Princess Kate is dealing honestly with a, you know, a big old cold helping of, uh, universal cosmic retribution or something like that karma ho however you want to call it there's gonna be some people who argue that you should set that aside this is a mother this is a mother this is a wife you know this is someone who's sick you shouldn't be doing that there's gonna be people who go either way and there are gonna be people who are really really extreme well there are people who are really really extreme on the side of you know um Princess Kate's side and then there's people who are really really extreme on the side of you know oh well you know nobody ever gave Prince Harry and Meghan Markle the privacy when they asked for privacy Buckingham Palace seemed to make that seem like they were asking for um you know I don't even know like a, a green monkey on a tricycle sucking a lollipop upside down you know when they asked for privacy so why is it you know so I just want to talk through this a little bit. I think of myself a little bit as the voice of reason. I think all y'all out there, my squatties and the derangers, you know, the grannies at home who friggin' love Kate. Okay, I get it, y'all love Kate. And they feel like they have to defend her at all costs. Guys, there are so many black women. I'm not even gonna lie. There are so many black women that's got Meghan Markle's back because so many of us have been through what she's been through. And I know there's going to be people that argue that, oh, she's biracial, whatever. We'll talk about that. Um, but I think you guys really, like, I try to be the voice of reason in between that. Now, of course, that's with the lens that I'm a millennial. I see myself in Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's story. I'm married to a white guy. You know, I come from, I don't know, the background of, you know, a regular old Southern black American family and growing up, I was around mostly black people, my family. But then, you know, as I went on into my schooling, secondary and primary, secondary and higher education, I started getting into more diverse groups. I started going to more affluent schools and getting more affluent or diverse multicultural opportunities. And so I feel like that's that's where I'm at. I don't, I don't, I don't, um, see myself as much in Kate's story, but, um, I do have to admit there, and I do have to admit that there was weirdness in the way they handled this with the photoshopping and some people are, 
how do you want to say some people are are really really good with that stuff like I work in advertising and I'm just I feel like the zoom feature is probably one of the best and worst things people ever invented because people really just be all up in your stuff and this clearly shows it now at first instinct at first glance when I saw that picture where her body was sort of redacted or retracted I rather I didn't make much of it because it was a small thumbnail and and I was just and I but it was a small thumbnail but I had heard all the buzzings how everybody was talking about oh is this photoshopped etc etc and I had heard the same thing about that car picture but not really looking much anything into it and I basically just thought guys get a life you're putting in too much thought into this and this is also as someone who has worked in a PR capacity there is a huge huge amount of photoshopping and um you know working and you know workshopping people's skin people's bodies even backgrounds that goes into this stuff so i was just like maybe just don't give it too much clout but then i actually started reading the coverage i started reading the articles i started listening to the podcast of people talking about it and in these different um, pieces of content people were zooming in they were showing you inconsistencies in the brick wall with the car photo they were showing you how grainy the picture was with the photo of her and the SUV with her mom for example um, and so um, and then when I looked at the picture with the with her body retracted sort of um, and when people zoomed in I was like oh yeah no there there is something there you guys are you're on to something um, I don't know whether it's sadder that this is what the Buckingham Palace felt that they had to do to cover up an illness, um, or if people have just that much, that much time on their hands that they can be like zooming in, like, oh, like, you know, like Nancy Drew on this thing. Um, but no, our internet sleuths, they really do, they bring us a lot of stuff, they bring accountability, but I just, I wonder if everybody on on both ends of the of the spectrum aren't being a little bit too um obsessive and that's where I get concerned but um after all is said and done Mamma Mia love that musical um not exactly the same thing but sort of the same thing recently there was a situation I think his name is Floyd Austin the Secretary of Defense uh, let me know in the comments if I'm getting that name wrong he had I think a prostate uh, procedure. I'm not completely sure if it was cancer or if, if if he had an enlarged prostate or something. But he had to go get an emergency procedure. Somehow the press found out about it, and um, all hell broke loose. And people were saying, "Oh, you need to be accountable. You need to apologize to everyone." And blah 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 blah. Now. I feel like a lot of these were just MAGA, you know, um, actors, players who were just feeding off of this situation and inflating it to be more than what it really was. It's like, give the guy a break. He just, okay, I get it. He's in a very high position in the military, a very important position. But if you don't think the U.S. military doesn't have money to have people in place just in case anything happens to this guy, you're freaking cracked. But I can understand how people are also very vigilant about wanting to know what's going on because Congress has been so disorganized, namely because of Republicans, um, that, you know, it took them so long to pass all these military titles because this extremist out of the state I was born in, Alabama, of course, which is why I got trucking out of there as soon as I could. But I still love y'all. But Tommy Tuberman, you know, he, Senator from Alabama, he blocked all of these military positions because he was upset that, you know, military insurance could cover a, a woman in the military going across state to get an abortion, you know. So they, they're still beating that drum and it's like they're just handing it over to the Democrats in 2024. So whatever. But um, anyway, the Secretary of Defense, Floyd Austin, I can't remember his name, whatever, the guy, um, black guy, um, very beautiful, dark skin, actually. I remember his face very well. I just don't know if I have his name right, but y'all let me know in the comments. Anyway, he had this procedure with the prostate thing. He didn't really let anyone know. The public is going crazy over it. Biden's just like, oh, all right, dude, sorry, sorry about that. Well, yeah, next time let us know, but uh, I hope you're feeling better. That's basically the extent of it, and that's how I felt, too. So, um, yeah, it's like some things, 
just don't line up. People say that racism is not as prevalent today, that America is not a racist country, that Great Britain is not a racist country. Um, but Donald Trump's followers, for example, have no problem with him not showing his medical records, even though every president before him has shown his medical records. But with him, you know, basically suburban white people are just like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But then this black secretary of defense has a medical procedure, which I feel like if you're having some medical stuff, it's okay. Take your time. Like, go do your stuff. It's okay to be a little bit confidential about that stuff. Um, you'll, you, I, I have all faith that he would have let the military know as things progressed if something would have been really dire. But when that happens with a black man, it's like, oh my God. And I, I'm not saying this is something that people are cognizant of. I think it's very, very, very deep, deep, deep in people's recesses of their subconscious and they don't know it. Princess Kate has cancer. I mean, a big medical emergency, but it seems like she's also got very good treatment and she's working through it. She has the ability to ask for privacy in this moment. But when Meghan Markle, you know, was in the depths of deep mental health crisis. I mean, I cannot um, underemphasize that. Like, I don't want to necessarily say cancer and depressive thoughts or unaliving thoughts are the same thing. But in a way, yeah, they're... They're both up there on the same thing. And it's not like this happy woman that got plucked out of America because she fell in love with a man that just happened to be white and happened to be a part of the British royal family. It's because of all the hate she was receiving online from trolls. So you guys get what I'm going. I, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're not there, if, you're not, if you don't get the parallels that I'm getting to and the irony and the hypocrisy, I feel like you probably, we just going to have to agree to disagree. <laughs> And we can move on, you know, we can kiki, whatever, but there we just, we, we won't have much that we can go forward with because, you know, people are stuck in their ways. But that's, that's kind of how I felt about this. But to bring it back, I, and I have to emphasize this, <laughs> I have to, do you see the way that I say that? I have to, into, uh, okay, listen, I have to emphasize this. I really, really do have to say that, um... Even though I love Meghan Markle, I'm not one of the people that hate Kate Middleton because I love Meghan Markle. And I don't think any of you guys out there who support Meghan Mar Markle should hate Kate Middleton as some sort of, you know, result of what you think should be transference. If I'm going to love Meghan Markle, I got to hate on Kate. I don't think that that should be the case. And I've always said that. And some of you guys uh, will tell me how you really feel about that. And I still love y'all. Um... <laughs> But I will say that um, I'm sad to hear about this news, you know, and uh, I told you guys back in the 90s to early 2000s, I'm sorry, early 2000s, um, I actually really liked Kate as a very, very young, like, preteen, <laughs> like very, very young. Um, I liked her, the way she dressed and stuff, but this is also, you got to think about the time, y'all. Everybody was like rocking Aeropostale jeans and like that was it Abercrombie and Fitch polo t-shirts and they were that was like people thought they were doing it and sh that she was kind of in that space so I I thought that she was sweet and I was disappointed when Meg Meghan Markle came to the family but only to a certain extent because we know unconscious biases exist out there they really really exist and studies are actually showing that they may exist even higher among white women um, and that's a whole nother video you know my best friend is a white woman but sometimes I think it's very very hard for white women to materialize what it's like to walk around in black skin and have the world see you as that Meghan Markle didn't really experience that in the beginning parts of her life but after she joined the royal family she did so I think that Kate could have handled that absolutely differently but, I, of course, I don't want to see anybody suffer. So you guys let me know what you think. Um, Celebrity said, Princess Kate's cancer announcement video was filmed by a BBC crew. This is from March 25th, 2024. It's by Kaiser. It says, I've already seen some of the TikToks and tweets claiming that the Princess of Wales' cancer announcement video was manipulated or that it was AI. But... I feel like AI is another space that we need to talk about. As someone who works within tech, I don't think that this was AI. Um, 
I think that what that is, is that people are a little paranoid now, right? People, they feel like their trust has been um, breached a bit. And so now people are just like extra uh, cognizant, extra paranoid, however you want to call it, right? So um, while I absolutely believe there has been a wealth of shenanigans over images of Kate this year, my personal opinion is that the video is authentic. As in, that's really Kate sitting there speaking to the camera. And something that I remarked immediately was the scenery of this. I saw a new segment where they said, oh, well, they thought, oh, it was very, very, you know, colloquial and, and um, sort of down to earth of Kate to be there in her jeans and a, just a regular shirt and there on a bench and, you know, with the flowers and everything. Okay. Guys, we get it. Okay. Yeah, we get that you guys want to seem relatable. And we know there's only so far that you can go with that when you're trying to uphold the dignity and, you know, posture of a 2,000-year-old institution. We get it. 1,000-year-old? More like 1,000, I guess. So, to me, the story is that someone, possibly Kate herself, realized that it was necessary to put Kate in front of a camera and show people that she's alive and she can speak for herself. Now me, um, I would have had rather had Kate move to the beat of the drum of Kate, you know. I feel like the world and social media kind of forced her out of her comfort zone. And that's something that I don't always love. But again, I get why. I don't blame people for wondering if there's some kind of conspiracy with this video too because as I said it's been non-stop BS from Kensington Palace all year but you know right there on what Kaiser just said non-stop BS um unlike the D the Danish the, the Denmark royal family or even some of the African royal families like the Congo royal family um I, I think that Great Britain still exists in this um, shadow place space. You know, I think they still exist in this space of where they really don't want to open themselves up to the public to seem too real. You know, and they're making tiny, tiny steps, but in comparison with other monarchies, I think not as much. And I honestly think as long as the British monarchy is around, I think it's going to be that way until it just forces itself, if it can, to get a little bit more real. Which is why I'm glad that the palace didn't do the video in-house with like Jason Knopf on his iPhone or whatever. They brought in a BBC team. And it shows the video. It takes a brief um, uh, piece from the Daily Mirror. I feel like we won't even entertain something like the Daily Mirror but it talks about how she's getting preventative chemotherapy of course it tries to weave a little bit about the um, Queen Elizabeth's funeral about King Charles's coordination it's like they have to kind of piece them all together because it's like they come as a package um talks a little bit about the controversy and that's it so Kaiser continues on would it be even more credible if someone from the BBC went on the record as a named source and said I was there, we shot on such and such and such camera, and we filmed it at 3.13 on Wednesday, for sure. But British media can't help themselves. Even in moments where a named source would simply lend credibility to the palace awash in shenanigans, they can't stop hiding behind anonymity. The unnamed sourcing within the British media reflects the poor state of journalism over there, girl in the west poor state of journalism in the west and that is why a lot of people especially millennial and gen z even some gen y and baby boomer black women are looking at stuff just like what you write kaiser are looking at black twitter you know are looking at black spaces on social media are looking at independent uh journalists because it, at, at the end of the day, it's a money game for many of these very, very large institutions. Okay, maybe for some of the independent journalists, some of the influencers, 
some of the blogs and vlogs out there, they also take a profit, okay? I mean, my channel is monetized. I get some, some peanuts from this channel, okay? But it's also just because I talk about the things I really care about and I get the opportunity to talk about it with other people who care about it. Um, and I want to make a, a good difference in the world. And I think many, many big media stations have forgotten about the making a good difference in the world. It says, as for questions about the backdrop, my first viewing was that they absolutely shot it in out outdoors on a bench, but maybe it was really was a backdrop. I don't know. Um, looking at it, you know, here, let me just play it real quick. Let me turn my volume down because you can know if it's uh, no, it looks like a backdrop. No. I'm going to say it looks like it's probably a backdrop because none of those flowers are moving, baby. And London is a, a windy, a windy, windy city. So it, it looks like a backdrop. But again, yeah, I don't see any birds flying through. Nothing. And the lighting on the bench actually looks like studio lighting now that I look at it because it's not warm in any sense you know Britain is a very gray country um but there usually there is still a little bit of warmth in the colors but again guys I I just I feel like we shouldn't be getting bogged down too much in the weeds here you know let's stop playing internet sleuths okay the woman has cancer Yes, she treated our girl Meghan Markle wrong. Leave her alone. Let her get her chemotherapy in peace. Um, but keep calling out the truth, okay? I, I, I think that I'm okay with that. Call out the truth, but only to the extent where it's not getting obsessive, right? So, let me know what you guys think about that in the comments. I was very, very shocked to hear that. You know, my jaw literally dropped when I saw it because like I said I don't I don't wish ill on anyone um but I really really was not expecting that and you know I don't I don't want to see anybody hurting so we have to talk about this Wendy Williams documentary holy crap guys holy crap <laughs> holy crap like okay so Wendy, you got, please let me know what y'all think in the comments. Like, I'm not trying to get on some, some, um, <laughs> some messy trifling gossip and stuff up in here. But, you know, it's a new time, y'all. It's a new time. And that's something with stuffy conservative folks really don't understand. They're like, oh, everybody today is an influencer. <sighs> it's not just about everybody being an influencer. This is just the way that we get to be able to communicate these days because, big huge corporations basically rigged everything so that everybody like doesn't have the, the the social space everybody's afraid now everybody's afraid to go like they used to go back in the day to Starbucks with five or five or six friends and hang out um like people don't go to the movies anymore because the political climate sto stochastic terrorism the the time is different and some good-hearted good intentioned people still want to have a recourse you know a discourse with one another and go back and forth in a respectful loving dare i say it way especially women especially black women um especially women of color minority women and the internet is a place that people get to do that and I, I wish that people would get it through, head, through their heads I don't think that this is going to be this way forever you know I think that at some point we will get back to our in-person times and let's hope to goodness that we do because I, I really miss those times but right now I mean I think that people should stop thinking with a closed lens of that oh everybody's an influencer I don't think it's really about that I think it's just this is a way that people have a chance to talk you know and excluding trolls, it actually can be really, really rich and really meaningful. Um, Wendy Williams, <laughs> like, uh, I, I really want to know what y'all think in the comments. Like, and I know that I always get to answer the comments, but I am reading them, y'all. And I, and I love seeing what y'all have to say. So please put them down there. Um, also, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, all the good stuffs. 
Um, you can also donate to this channel by sending me a super thanks or a super chat. Um, when I watched this documentary, and I've got this article here from Perez Hilton. I had to pull up a Perez Hilton article really to get someone to just give it without all the who's, ha's, ha, who, ha. And that's one thing that I actually really miss about like that vintage late 90s, early 2000s gossip. Everything was not about um, production value. Everything was not about like, um, yeah, everything wasn't about production values and transitional frames, transition effects, you know, how jazzy fonts you can find. It was actually about the substance of the matter, people being able to make you laugh. And that's what Wendy Williams was about. As much as I don't love some of the choices of the woman, I hated that interview with her and Whitney Houston. People still talk about that thing 20 years later on. I think that she often um, was very straightforward in trying to grill people about their lives, but wasn't as forthcoming when it came to the shadow parts of her life. Um, I think she maybe didn't make the best choice in a life partner, and I think she realizes that. I think her illnesses have a lot to do with that. I think that maybe she forgot about that little girl from, where was it? Was it Jersey? She, she goes to her house at some point. I think she forgot about that girl. And, um, you know, to see her father in the show, to see her brother and stuff, it, it humanizes Wendy for, for me. I think her niece was a little theatrical, but at the same time, she kind of reminded me of myself and my cousin a little bit. So, I don't know, maybe she just is, like, really passionate about her family member, but I thought it was um, in poor taste. I, I mean, I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, it was refreshing to see Wendy, you know, because the, the name of the documentary gives away. Everybody's like, where is Wendy? I'm wondering where is that keen spirit that I love, that beautiful spirit that I love from, you know, back in the day. Um, I think if, if Wendy is way further than Britney Spears. And I think Wendy is dealing with some different types of trauma. And she's channeling it into alcoholism, which is not a good look for her. Um, I think that's, that some of her health issues have to do with those boobs, you know? I think that she, she said she has never ever gone back in there and flipped them. Or maybe she said she did once, but she, they, they've been in there for maybe 30 years. I think maybe she said once she got it. I can't remember if it was never or once, but, um, collagen releases from those things into your body. That stuff is not, um... It's not natural, you know, and it, it's it gets into your body and it, it, it messes with your humors and with your circulatory system and with um, your muscle mass and your, your heart. And I just, this is where I'm like, the cost of beauty. Yes, those things are beautiful. They're beautiful. But why are you being so stubborn with that? And, you know, honestly... That stubbornness that I see from her, I see it, how is the best way to put this? I sometimes see it in a lot of people who have just been stuck. They've been stunned into some part of their childhood or their young adulthood where they were just traumatized. And they just can't get back, you know. And I think that therapy helps with things like that. I think that education and educating oneself on topics around trauma, topics around mental health, but even all other topics, either going back to school or things like that. I think that connecting with your family and the people who have known you your whole life, cultivating your hobbies, um, being outside, literally getting sun, being outside with your friends and going places. I think those are things that help that, but often those people just, they hold on to that trauma their whole life. Um, and they just become very stubborn in their ways and alcohol is the best way for them to just alcohol or drugs or sex or some other vice is just the best way for them to turn. And I think for a long time that vice for her was gossip. You know, I, like I'm not trying to take my psychology 101 and like break it all down this way, but it was sad to see because I think I don't think people can really verbalize why it's sad. They can say 
looking at this documentary is sad, but why is it sad? I think it's sad because we're looking at the effects of long-term trauma and it was channeled into that gossip for a while and it built her a beautiful career. But even during that time, there's talk that she was, you know, using drugs, abusing drugs. And now that trauma has turned into early onset, uh, you know, is it Alzheimer's or dementia? I'm sorry. Um, it's turned into vodka bottles in the bed you know and I think it's very sad to see someone deteriorate that way that's what we're looking at but Perez Hilton you know it I, I feel like in a different world, per, world Perez Hilton could be the person to take over the Wendy le legacy someone like him you know but everything is so scattered these days and with that same uh, ecosystem that I praise you know this open ecosystem where you know influencers and podcasters and vloggers and creators and artists and musicians and actors and all of us can just like do our own thing because of the internet um I also miss back in the day the 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 ecosystem of the radio that produced personalities like Wendy Williams and early ecosystems of blogging um and you know actual print gossip rags magazines that produce people like Perez Hilton and sometimes I wish we could go back to that day um anyway so let's talk about this I, I I know that Perez Hilton not everybody loves him and I I admit I only check him for very specific things it usually has to do with Beth Bethany Frankel <laughs> it usually has to do with the housewives it usually has to do with people like Wendy Williams and I check him because he despite his faults despite the things that people have said about him over the years. I know y'all think he's crazy and everything. Um, but he has a wealth of knowledge. And I <clears throat> I honestly think. And some of y'all are going to call me crazy on this one. I honestly think Perez Hilton has a very warm heart. You know like there are those gossip journalists like Wendy Williams. Who went for the jugular. And I think Perez Hilton back in the early 2000s would also go for the jugular, but it was always in good fun and you could tell it was in good fun. And I think that some 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 people, some people today who want to get into that gossip or news or pop culture journalism space could take a note. You know, people think that, oh, that's so in the past, whatever. But yeah. So y'all let me know what you think. But anyway, this is from PerezHilton.com. It says, Wendy Williams' family breaks silence on her shocking and heartbreaking struggles ahead of the new doc. It says, Will Wendy Williams' family is opening up ahead of her new documentary. In a candid story for People Out Wednesday, the former daytime TV talk host's loved ones and business partners are opening up, opening up about the struggles she's been through over the last three years. Pretty much ever since she stepped out of the spotlight to tackle a series of physical and mental health struggles, reflecting on this, her niece, Alex Finney, began, We've all seen the images all over the last few months, and really few years, of what has seemed like a, sig a spiral for my aunt. It was shocking and heartbreaking to see her in this state. And exactly, you know, that's that right there is what I feel. I feel like it was just heartbreaking. And I want to pause here and say, I also feel like um, I need to address that Sherry Shepard's, you know, situation here. I did a video about this a while back. Take a look at it if you can. Um, but I feel like Sherry Shepard could have been a good idea. I think she is a good idea to a certain extent. The added layer of her being a great idea is if she would have really embraced Wendy as a mentor. As a mentor. But that would have required some humbling. That would have required some humility. And we live in a world right now where people just don't do that. And if you look at the track record of Sherry Shepard and... And I like the woman, but um, if you hear a little bit about her ex-husband, about her child, um, there are some problematic things in her past, uh, despite despite her warmth and, and charisma, you know. And um, the show business world can be so cutthroat. And I, I feel like this is partly why this, there is a 
can you guys put your finger on it? There's just this like, there's a slight just hint of seething, seething, like dark resentment in Wendy. And you can feel it. I mean, most people can feel this stuff. If we got real about the fact that we're animals, we're human beings, and not everything is communicated with these words, you know, some things are communicated with the way we say our words, with the way we move our bodies, with the things that we do. And there is some unsaid, said stuff that Wendy is saying, and I think she is very resentful um, of Sherry Shepard. And I think that could be one of the resolves. You know, if Sherry Shepard could give her a video call, if they could do a quick video call or something like that, I think that could be very beneficial for Wendy. But I'm going to leave that there because I know it probably won't happen. Um, it says, oof, so true. This is going to what Perez Hilton's blog kind of says. Oof, so true. Alex and many family members will appear in Lifetime's upcoming two-part series, Where is Wendy Williams? Okay, so this was also set before it came out, but I watched the whole thing. We'll talk about it. Which is set to chronicle the 59-year-old's health and legal problems as of late. And it's, it's noteworthy that before... I'm assuming it's Perez Hilton who either oversaw this coverage or someone who works closely with his teams. And even before they've even seen it, they're saying, oof, you know, and that, that was my exact reaction, watching the whole thing, so it's there. According to People, the documentary crew began filming in August 2022. They had been intending to follow Wendy's journey, launching a new podcast after the Wendy Williams show was canceled amid her struggles. But when her health issues arose, the story took a different angle. They stopped filming in April 2023 when things became, became too problematic for the star. Then that same month, she was replaced into she was placed into a facility for cognitive issues. Her manager and ju jeweler, Will Selby, revealed. Will, he seems good, nice enough. I, I would love to see her working with a woman. Maybe not a woman like the woman that she has. She seems a little sus, but you know what else. Um, her son, Kevin Hunter Jr., claimed doctors believe the memory loss issues are due to her alcohol abuse. She is still in the facility to this day and only her legal guardian has full access to her including knowing her whereabouts and when or if she will ever be released. The legal guardian has some problematic issues as well. We'll talk about that in another video. If Wendy wants to talk to family, she has to be the one to call them. Wow. As you can imagine, this is a gut-wrenching reality for her loved ones. Wendy's sister and Alex's mom Wanda Express. Wanda's testimony was amazing. Um, you can tell her family really cares for her, but that conservative system is so focused on image, upholding these images, these toxic images that Hollywood and corporate greed has created. Um, and money. That's all it's about. It, upholding these images that nobody really believes in the first place and money. And it's just so sad to see. But you can see her family really wants to consolidate efforts to take care of her. They want to bring her into her their arms and take care of them in their own homes, you know, with their home cooked food, with their doctors, you know. But the powers that be just won't let them. And I think that poses an even bigger societal question for us, you know. Are we that emotionally unintelligent? I get it. The corporate profit, you know, public figures and all that. But are we that emotionally unintelligent? It seems quite emotionally unintelligent. Um, so it says, from an outsider's POV, there's a S ton of issues. From financial hiccups to drinking problems, Wendy has been through it. I'm going to skip on down. It tells more about the family's testimonies and... The family is essentially what I just said. They want to get their, her in their own homes. They want her to stop drinking. They want her to be healthy, to be eating healthy. They want her to be able to have laughs with their family. And people don't understand it, but them laughs with family shouting. Oh, those could be healing themselves. Just being around the people who really love you. But the powers that be won't let it. So the article ends with a quote from 
Wanda. So it says, hitting back, hitting back at criticisms, this new docuseries will only exploit the celeb more, Ford no noted. We asked ourselves almost every day, is this happening? Is this helping Wendy or is it hurting her? And in the end, we felt like it was helping her. This is about the guardianship system and how it can be improved. Wanda added, there is not a person in this family who doesn't want the same thing for Wendy, and that is her health. And while not everyone is thrilled with the new project, Alex insisted Wendy can't wait to start the next chapter of her life. Whoa. It's obviously a really complex and heartbreaking situation for them all. We sincerely hope Wendy is getting the care she needs. This is all so sad. That's the way the article ends. We sincerely hope Wendy is getting all the care she needs. This is also sad. It was basically, I mean, that's, that was, that's almost word for word exactly how I felt. I started watching it thinking I was only going to go to the Black China part, you know, because when I saw that bumper or that, that piece of it where Black China appears in the documentary, it felt so authentic. It didn't feel glamorized and Hollywoodified, you know, even though you got two women with their wigs and their hair did up and the makeup and all that stuff. But that felt so real. The moments with Wendy and her family felt so real. Um, and I thought I was just kind of going to skip through those parts to hear what her son had to say, to hear a little bit about her sleazy old ex-husband, to hear what, you know, Black China had to say. But then I could not turn away from it. It was sad and it was somehow relatable all at the same time. I wish I had the answer, but I think that, I mean, that, that point about the guardianship system needing to be reformed, it really needs to take account that people are people, they're human. Um, they have families, you know, the, this thing that Hollywood and pop culture and New York City and LA creates is not all about the viewers us you know who are consuming it's also about the people and you know what's the human life so i i think that's the case but it's so hard to go up against these banks and these corporations child um i can't say i feel like that right there combined with that um trauma that trap trauma that we talked about earlier is what makes us feel hopeless um that this is all so sad you know like I, I don't think it's absolutely hopeless you know we can continue to have faith but it just is all so sad so we'll keep praying for Wendy we'll pray for her family we'll even pray for Sherry um we'll even pray for that assistant who people were just trashing her um her hair and you know saying that she was a gold, a gold digger well not even gold digger she's not Wendy's girlfriend but she's her what, what was she like her publicist or something who knows um guys let me know what you think yeah that was all so much so jumping right back into it I want to talk to you guys about Halle Bailey at the SAG Awards she looked absolutely stunning she always looks very beautiful but I also just get from her very down-to-earth warm energy so I really love seeing her there um I just want to say we love and support you Hallie girl um the thing is is America is very very um liberal and progressive in many ways right but in so many ways it's still kind of lagging behind in its open-mindedness you know i'm american but i live in europe and there's this thing where they say that what do they say they say that the most conservative no 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 they i think they say the most liberal american is fairly uh, a fairly centrist european and that's not always the case. Sometimes I feel like Europeans, especially depending on the country, like I live in France, they're more conservative. But in terms of just open-mindedness, sometimes America just has its moments. And when The Little Mermaid came out with Halle Bailey, which 
Guys, The Little Mermaid was such a huge part of my childhood. So I did do coverage on my channel about The Little Mermaid back when it came out. And seeing it in theaters was so euphoric and so, um, how do you want to say, nostalgic for me. But it was also something that was so new and in inspiring as well. Seeing a person who looked more like me on the screen, you know, than the original character. You know, Ariel has red hair, of course she has pale skin, and this was something that was groundbreaking. It was revolutionary. And a lot of pushback. Um, mostly from what seemed like white conservatives just really really had a problem with the lead of Little Mermaid being black because I feel like in their rational minds they just couldn't re-envision this old classic with a different race in it it's like in their heads it's like the woman was white before why not have a white person again but for black people and there were some black people as well who said you know why do we always have to have leftovers? Why don't we get a new character? And I hear that as well. But, you know, for I, I told this in my review of the movie, but there was a little black girl, you know, who is was the age that I was when I saw the original Little Mermaid. And I could hear her behind me laughing. I could hear her behind me humming and getting out of her chair. Her mom had to tell her to keep had to keep telling her to sit down because she was just so flipping excited. There were people of all races, all ages too in the in the theaters. There were older people, there were younger people, and they really, really, um, how do you want to say, reacted very fondly to Halle Bailey. So I think this is this thing where um, we have to look at the, the young woman's raw talent. I mean, she's very, very talented. She's also beautiful, not just on the outside, but on the inside. And you can really see that. And her voice is wonderful. You also have to look at the age thing. You know, this is a film that people of all ages really enjoyed. I would say it's right up there with Barbie. I did not see Barbie. But in, in, as far as um, the sort of family factor you know where the whole family can see it I think it was engaging on that end and then it was also engaging on the end of this was something that was answering certain social questions you know certain social um, complexities that were on the minds of people and I feel like Hallie has not let pressures you know of what trolls say on social media what extremely polarized people online say get to her you know and she sort of kept that that beautiful spirit and I could see that and when you see that particularly within women as a you know the female community and within the black community when there are things like this where there's an underdog being pushed into a situation where if it's with women, you know, where let's say, for instance, there is a CEO and all of the positions of that CEO position previously were male. And there's finally a, a woman in there and everybody's ridiculing that woman for reasons we know is around sexism. And I'm not a bleeding heart feminist or anything like that. But this is the world that these are real questions that we have to think through. Um, often women will swoop in to defend them, you know, to advocate for them. And I'm a believer that nobody can really advocate for groups better than the groups in which those people come from, representatives of that those groups. You know, for instance, um, my sister who works in the military, a high-ranking position within health in the military. Um, at one point, she had to work on a Native American reservation in... Um, Phoenix, Arizona, it was actually in Flagstaff, and I actually got to visit her, seeing her sort of in, you know, that zone. And um, sometimes when you have displaced groups like that, for example, if it's with the Native American reservations or if it's with um, the black community, if it's with the women's community, if it's with, let's say, um, you know, any other minority like it helps to have a representative face from that group because nobody will advocate like I said like that group and I feel like that for Hallie I feel like the black community has had her back from the beginning and it hasn't been 
super super overstated i haven't been seeing people screaming about it you know on social media you know oh hallie they're just judging her because she's black blah, 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 blah. you know i haven't seen that you know the way that some people will do for will and jada or whoever it is drake or it maybe it hasn't been to that level but in spaces online i do see people reacting very well to her performance and i see people kind of you know just like in a very organic, natural way, just basically saying, I got your back, sis. Like, I got your back. And I got your back, girl. We love you. This was exemplified. And I don't want to assume to speak for someone. You know, I don't want to assume to speak for someone. I know that these conversations are um, difficult. They're nuanced. My husband is white. We have lots of these conversations where sometimes it's difficult. But if you push further, sometimes you get to a deeper more rich profound place and I don't want to speak for anyone but Sterling K Brown I've got this article here if you guys haven't seen it just look at the interaction between Halle Bailey and Sterling K Brown on the red carpet with this news uh this uh how do you even want to call it like the paparazzi the people the reporters I guess you'll call it who are out there sometimes talking to the actors or whatever and Sterling K. Brown basically expressed that sentiment for Hallie in that moment, you know, because as someone who's got this little, you know, channel, which I hope grows, but uh, right now it's quite little. But even from this, I can see just from the color of my skin, just from my parts, <laughs> not to like, you know, but just from my parts, my skin, you know, maybe my cultural background as an American. Sometimes people just assume I'm like some stupid girl that fell off the back of a cabbage truck, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, I have seven years of higher education. <laughs> you know, worked ten years in corporate America, but hey, what do I know? But, you know, I, I think that sometimes people really underestimate you. And even before my professional or higher education experience, I had a lot of other stuff. I went to an art high school. You know, came from this crazy, wacky family. I'm one of eight kids. You know, there's a lot of things, but people on the face value, they will look at you and they'll assume. And I think every person who might be from a, you know, marginalized group, whether you're a woman, whether you are um, from uh, the Native American, a Native American reservation, or you grew up on a reservation, whether you are um, an Arab uh arabic a person from an arabic speaking country you know or you are um african american or you're hispanic american or you're second generation immigrant uh whatever it might be whatever it might be i think sometimes you understand that struggle and people will give you a hand up and, and it might not, not even be in a, a hand up in a tangible way it might just be like i got you sis and I feel like that is what transpired between Sterling K. Brown. I've loved Sterling K. Brown since Army Wives. Like, dude, I love Sterling K. Brown because he was basically like the, <laughs> I don't even know how to call it, house dad. You know, I guess you call it like a housewife. He's like a house, da house, house husband. I don't know. Of the group and, um. I was just, I mean, he's a great actor and he's also got a great spirit. Loved him in, in Supernatural and I feel like he had to give her that moment because a lot of us have been in that space. We've been in that space where we've been in the room and we've been the only woman, we've been the only person of color, we've been the only LGBTQ person, LGBTQ plus person. You guys know what I'm getting at, right? Or or even deeper than that, you could have been the only Republican person, not to eliminate people. You could have been the only uh, conservative person. You could have been the only white person. You could have been the only European. You could have been the only um, Spanish person, Latino person, fat person. You, you know, you get it. It's just sometimes when someone who's been through the same thing that you've been through kind of just says like, I got you, bro. I got you, sis. It's really, really refreshing. So this is from E.T. It says, Hallie Bailey sheds tears as Sterling K. Brown and his wife praise her during SAG Awards moment. The 23-year-old actress grew emotional as the couple showered her with praise for her performance in The Little Mermaid. Oh, guys, I had that Little Mermaid on VHS. I'm getting such memories. 
It says, Halle Bailey was just overcome with emotions at the 2024 Screen Actors Guild Awards after Sterling K. Brown and his wife, Ryan Michelle Bath, paused their red carpet interview with E.T.'s Kevin Frazier to shower the 23-year-old actress with high praise for her portrayal in The Little Mermaid. The other thing is her age. I mean, look, she's young, but she's already so talented. The other thing, I think the SAG after the SAG, I'm sorry, not SAG after the SAG awards. I also think there was probably a lot of emotions around the, those awards because we all see it happening right now. We see the corporate greed that just is consuming every facet of our lives that just didn't, you know, even 10 years ago, even 20 years ago, it's just it's everywhere and it's touching everything including you know actors including film and television including corporate the corporate space including politics um including government including um infrastructure including construction i mean everything everything and it i was thinking about farmers even farmers are getting out there and protesting because of this greed that is just you know, slashing everyone's living wage and the middle class is just completely disappearing. It's like either you're ultra wealthy or you're poor. And I, I have the feeling that people think of actors as being hyper wealthy and sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. And sometimes they really aren't getting paid what they're due, you know, and not even just that. They're not being heard, you know, like they're really not being heard. They feel like they don't have a voice. They feel like they're just a part of a machine. They're cogs in a machine pumping out gunk. If you I'm, I'm going to talk about film a little bit later. I have a theory on why film um, is so kind of crap right now. But if you look at it since about 2010, arguably before, maybe even 2004, Television and movies have gotten real lazy, right? They've gotten real lazy. It's just like, oh, okay. It's like some some exec, some movie exec just says, oh, this has kind of worked in the past. So, yeah, let's do that. But, I mean, it just, it, it's, it's disconcerting to say the least. And it can be, um, can make you feel a little hopeless, can make you a little, uh, feel a little faithless, but when you band together with other people to advocate for what you believe in, that's when you get somewhere. And so I feel like that's what the actors and the writers are doing with SAG, with SAG-AFTRA. And I feel like good for them because I feel like that is, insp even seeing what, you know, the automakers, um, the UAW, um, uh, protests, the farmers protest. I feel like even the people who are protesting about this, you know, abortion stuff, this is the stuff that really is going to inspire others to get up and advocate for what they believe in. Because otherwise, the powers that be that are pulling the strings will just keep um, doing what uh, pumps out money and, and pushes their strange interest forward. So anyway, um, the sweet moment unfolded Saturday at the Sh Shrine Auditorium in downtown Los Angeles as Bailey was in the middle of her interview with E.T.'s Michelle Turner. And she literally was in the middle of the interview. I remember this. Bailey had mentioned how much she admires the This Is Us star and his wife, prompting Turner to interrupt the couple's interview to relay the sentiment. I love This Is Us too. It says, and the feeling was mutual. She's lovely, Brown gushed. She represented so well for us. So what do you guys think that us means? Put that down in the comments because, you know, based on the kind of little intro I just gave there, I feel like that us really breaks past race. You know, it is race, but it's so much more. It's being a part of a human collective. It's them being actors. It's them advocating for the SAG stuff we just talked about. Um, the vibes. I'm getting so many vibes, literally. I mean, we were streaming tears at the end of it because you were beautiful. Your soul is beautiful. Your talent was radiant. If you had done it and you were bad, nobody would be messing, but you killed it. 
that says it all right guys like that pretty much says it and I feel a little bit of that in there you know if if she was just hot mess of course I think people would still be buzzing about it people would still be saying oh my god look at this this is crap did you see what they put out oh my god the stuff sucks did you see how she was looking so busted and crusty? Oh my, she's such a bad actress. She can't even read a line with a little bit of personality. Like, I can just imagine all of the comments. It would have been something like that. But, that, you know, haters pretty much are the loudest when you, when you got your stuff going on. When you got your groove going on. So, I would like to know what you guys think. Tell me about that. You know, was it that... Um, this was an issue of, you know, were we being overly paranoid? Were we being overly paranoid? Was this not about race at all? Was it more just about the sanctity of the storyline? I guess people feel that attached to The Little Mermaid. I mean, I get it. I, I also explained how I felt quite attached to it as it's a part of my childhood and I'm nostalgic. But if they chose to say, for example, have The Little Mermaid cast as an Asian American woman, Asian American girl, whatever, woman, girl, I would be fine with that. I wouldn't have a problem with that. I would say, actually, good for them, you know, good to that they're getting some representation in there. Good that some Chinese American or Asian American girl or, or Asian girl or any girl could you know, see themselves, but particularly that an Asian person could see themselves in that, especially since oftentimes you don't see um, people of color getting those leading roles. So are we being overly sensitive or was this itch an issue or a question of the richness of the movement that's happening around activism, including SAG? Or was it more just that human element? I would love to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments. So I wanted to talk to you guys about MSNBC. Um, I haven't let it go. I'm still mad. I'm still mad MSNBC. I'm mad that MSNBC got rid of Mehdi Hassan. I literally used to just watch MSNBC for only a few people. It would usually be, and some of y'all don't hate me now, it would usually be in this order. It would be like, Morning Joe tied with Joy Reid goes back and forth sometimes. Sometimes I lean towards Joy Reid because she just is very frank speaking and she's got that sort of like fast New York sort of she just like runs along uh, with this fast New York rhetoric and she gets this stuff really fast. But she also does it with a level of empathy and she's funny, you know, and she's real. Um, so, and I've got a long history with her. Joy Reid has been a staple in, in my household for a long time. Um, Morning Joe, even though Joe Scarborough had his questionable stuff back when he was a senator, um, <laughs> and even though the scandal between Mika and Joe was uh, big news back in the day, and some people, they don't like them because they think that they're sort of performative um, how do you want to say performative devil's advocate like they, they try to like play both sides of the card democrat conservative I think you know Joe Scarborough he used to be a big conservative and he's pretty much just sort of like backed away from the Republican Party Mika's been a long time democrat I love that I love seeing their interactions together it honestly reminds me a little bit of me and my husband because it's not that my husband is super conservative, but uh, looking at Mika and Joe, they've got this dynamic that it's just, I don't know, they're, they're like two sides of a coin. And th it, it flows very well between them. You know, they're sort of diff even just with their differences of approaches, it works really well together. The banter, right? The banter is what it's about. And, um, you know, I like the panels, the the. You know, like Family Guy said, the multiple screen with one guy louder than all the other guys. Um, but, you know, also Morning Joe just kind of delivers the news in a very uh, straightforward but entertaining and, and digestible way, right? Behind that was Mehdi Hassan. So I guess Mehdi Hassan was second because Morning Joe and Joe Reed would kind of come, Joy Reed would kind of come um, scored up together. 
And then after after Medi would be Simone. After that would probably be uh, Ali Vichy. I think that's how you say his name. Um, Lawrence O'Donnell. Uh, I do like uh, Rachel Maddow. Um, but I'm not as much as a fangirl as a lot of people are. And uh, Stephanie Rule is cool. And uh, oh, I really like um, the lady who just had a baby. What's her name? Nicole Wallace. I do really like Nicole. Nicole Wallace probably goes up to number four or something. I don't know. Something like that. But Mehdi Hassan was one of my favorites because it's always refreshing to see a brown face. Okay. It's just like I, I don't mean to sound biased. But like I just said in the segment previous talking about Halle Bailey, um, it's nice to sometimes see a face like yours because nobody's going to advocate for you like somebody from that group will. You know, it's, it's basic psychology. It comes back to like our limbic system and our reptilian brain, right? And I feel truly, 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 truly that that last interview that Mehdi Hassan had with that Israeli secretary, the guy, Mark Zavel, Revel, something like that. What's his name? What is his name? Let's figure it out. I think it was Mark, um, Mark, 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 Mark. What's your name, Mark? Mark something. Mark Regev. Mark Regev. Um, Rashida Tlaib, she also got some flack in Congress for speaking up for the Palestinians who the, the thousands, thousands, like 30,000 or something innocent Palestinians who have died um, in this business over in Israel. And, of course, like everybody else, I do feel the need to caveat and say Israel should be able to defend itself. Obviously, of course. But one, two thousand people, innocent people killed on Israel's side, paired up to like 20, 30,000 people on Palestine's side, it stinks. It stinks to high heaven. And people know that it does. You know, this NATO resolution that the U.S. was absolutely quiet, you know, like a church mouse in, is reprehensible. It's reprehensible and people should be ashamed of themselves, you know. And it's biblical. It's quite literally biblical. If you look in the Bible, you know, this is that type of stuff where, of course, you know, there are figures like Netanyahu in the Bible who think that they are so justified in what they're doing you look at what happened in moscow this attack from isis isis k or whatever i'm pretty sure they feel very very justified in what they're doing passionate okay but sometimes you gotta step back and you gotta actually let the creator speak because sometimes i, I mean violence is just not the way it's not the way and I understand that that could sound naive to some because the war in Israel, the wars in Israel and Ukraine and all the other wars happening all over, you know, especially the ones in Africa that many people don't talk about. And, and I'll talk about that in a different segment because it's very complex. But, you know, even those understated places like um, um, Omar, Omar C, you know, the French actor said, you know, he said something, he made a statement, and people got on all on him about it. But he said something to the effect of people always talk about the Afghan-Iraq war, but what about the African kids that lose their lives every day in war? And maybe people just look at that as gangs. Maybe people just look at that as uprisings or effects of colonization, you know, or, um, you know, bad de-doers, whatever it is. But it's true, you know, there are these little mini wars happening every day in places where people don't get nearly as much coverage. Um, even in the U.S., 30, 38, like 40 percent or something of the missing people in the U.S. are black. <laughs> black people make up 13 percent of the population, but like almost half of the missing people in the U.S. are black. To me, that's that that pretty much sounds like war. It's biblical. It's biblical. And so 
you got to ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? What's the right thing to do? So I think that Mehdi Hassan was really, really, I think it was hitting him. You know, it's like, oh my God, I don't even want to like get emotional. But the biggest thing I could compare it to, just looking at the way he was talking with the guy in the video and um, seeing his re reactions and looking in his eyes, I got the same feeling of when I saw George Floyd's death under the knee of that cop. And it's an image that really is just burned in my head, you know. And sometimes I will go and I'll look up Derek Chauvin or whatever the guy's name was who unalived George Floyd. And that picture comes up, which that's a whole other thing. I, I wish that there was more censorship to the internet, you know. Um, sometimes Google says it, it's going to blur images. Other times it doesn't. So it's like, dude, I, I would rather you <laughs> blur dead bodies than like somebody's boobies or whatever like blur the stuff that's going to traumatize people but every time I see that image it really traumatizes me and it, it hits me in a place where maybe someone who's Asian and maybe they do but maybe someone who's Asian or Latino or white or um uh Latin American or 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 I don't know Middle Eastern Maybe they don't see it that same way. Maybe it just doesn't hit them like that. But to see, to see him, you know, blue, lifeless with some bee on his neck because of cigarettes. To me, it's like looking at an uncle. It's like looking at a brother. It's like looking at a cousin. And the fact that those coverages of the news are on TV every single day. It's repeated trauma like looking at a brother or a cousin or a, a son or um, your neighbor or somebody you went to school with every single day. Every single day. So imagine how the Palestinians feel. I get it. I get it. I, am, I, I understand. Imagine how the Israelis feel as well. But it, it's not a competition. It's not a competition, but you have to acknowledge that this war on not Netanyahu's part and his government, his administration's part, has not been well done. It has not been well done. You know, nobody's been captured from Hamas, but thousands of um, innocent civilians have lost, have lost, excuse me, have lost their lives. And, and Mehdi Hassan... He touched on that, and it was too much for the 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 media machine. It was too much for MSNBC, and it's I it's absolutely atrocious. I absolutely find that behavior reprehensible. Um, I love MSNBC a lot. I do, but some stuff. You know, honestly, if I'm being quite honest, I feel like some far right players from Donald Trump's people, maybe even to Netanyahu's people, got in MSNBC's ear. Because sometimes, you guys know how those cars for auto school have two wheels in it, you know, and sometimes the like instructor can jerk that thing back if the student is going too fast or too far or something like that. Imagine that going back and forth, back and forth, and this car just like, you know, scurrying in the road. I feel like that's kind of what MSNBC's coverage has been since around a little bit before the time that they fired Mehdi Hassan. And I think it truly has to do with the fact that um, I feel like some people are, are really kind of, the coverage that they're doing is wonderful. They're doing what a lot of news stations are not doing which is speaking truth to power. They're saying Donald Trump is terrible. They're saying the, the war in Israel is being fought very badly on the part of Netanyahu. Um, they're saying that Putin is a tyrant. But if you look at their comment sections, if you look at the people going after MSNBC, it's like they're terrible. So they're doing all this good stuff. They're speaking truth to power of Donald Trump, of Putin, of Netanyahu and his, the, his bad strategy. But they're going to fire Mehdi Hassan, you know? And I was already pissed off that CNN fired Don Lemon. 
I stopped watching CNN because of that and they will not they will not get my eyeballs back until they get a face that looks like me back in there to replace him or bring him back and that still might not really make it right um MSNBC I, I don't know I don't know what it is I haven't really been able to 100% let go I did unsubscribe um, from their YouTube channel I still watch their YouTube videos but I unsubscribed as I guess my little show of of of, of um, my stance but yeah it was hurtful so listen to what some people said on reddit this person what this person said really struck me they said thank you for sharing this they shared an article basically chronicling how Medi left and he started his own you know um, channel they said thank you for sharing this I hadn't seen it I'm still so angry at MSNBC for this and I'm glad he set out on his own rather than remaining there after being unceremoniously demoted and treated like crap. And I generally find CNN more disappointing than MSNBC, but good for them for getting him on air. Somebody else said MSNBC messed up by letting him go. I'm happy to see he's still active and looking forward to hearing him again. Someone said, go Medi. I'm thrilled for him and look forward to his new ventures. You know, you can just see through these comments like me how much raw support there is for him. And it's not, I hope I described that well. I feel like maybe I didn't express the fact that it's not just because he's brown and I'm brown that I support him. It's because he's a freaking amazing journalist, you know. Did you guys see that interview between him and Vivek Ramaswamy? You know, like watch my video coverage on that. That that just that right there exemplifies what a talented a talented talented voice that they let go, you know. It just it's so stupid to me. And it's going to come back to bite them in the butt and Don Lemon is going to come back, not Don Lemon himself, but that Don Lemon situation is going to come back to bite CNN in the butt history doesn't forget this stuff yeah so listen to this let's read about this because I really feel like this Mark Regev guy was a Judas kind of just planted in there you know he was a plant and Vivek Ramaswamy was a plant for Don Lemon as well so listen to this pay attention to what MSNBC and CNN do, uh, do not say how dare MSNBC remove Medi's show because he protested the genocide in Gaza how dare MSNBC fire Mehdi because of what Mark Regev, the Israeli advisor, commanded what Mehdi could and could not say on live TV. And commanded is what he did, right? He really did say that, you know, like um, someone said right below this comment, excellent point about Mark Regev literally saying you can't say that, Mehdi. The control, the control that this guy tried to enact on Mehdi Hassan, the control that Netanyahu tries to enact over the Palestinians, over even the Israelis, I'm sorry, the Israelis, that right there to me is uh, white supremacy, but just with a Jewish face. It's, 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 it's ghastly. It's reprehensible. And the UN was right to protest against this. Something has to be done. So the, 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 the poster on here goes on to say, Mark Regev is no diplomat. There is no diplomacy for genocide. People wake up. MSNBC and CNN gaslight the American people that Trump is a threat to democracy. Our entire government is a threat to democracy. I don't really agree with all that. Hold on, hold on. Okay, let let's 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 finish with see reading what the the guy says or the person says, and then I'll I'll decompact or comp decompress all this stuff. The American class works for the government. The government does not work for us. The media divides us. As long as we fight over woke issues, the government wins. Corporate America and the industrial war complex will continue to steal from all of us. The rich get richer. The poor get poorer. Death equals profits. Netanyahu and Biden must be charged for war crimes. Now that the golden handcuffs are off, I hope Mehdi stops defending Joe Biden 
and holds him accountable for the American people and to citizens of the world. Good luck to many Hassan. I don't agree at all with the stuff about Joe Biden. I don't agree at all with the stuff that, it, that this person said about the government. I think that the government absolutely can work for the American people. But the American people have to demand that the government work for them. I mean, this is a democracy. This is not a monarchy. This is not a system where a king tells us what to do and we just go do it. It's a democracy that you have to continue to workshop. You can't just put your hands up and throw in the towel every time something doesn't go just your way. And you also have to realize that you're taking the legacy of people who have created this democracy we lived in since 1776, you know? And, and the first settlements in America were when? 1650? So not only are we juggling the stuff that we're dealing with, we're, we're also kind of trying to put the puzzle pieces in of what they left before. Joe Biden, on top of that, Joe Biden has done so much for the U.S. He's brought more jobs. He's actually called out racism and sexism, and homophobia. He's trying to get production back to the people who have been working the, the labor jobs that this person is talking about. But Joe Biden did not create the unrest between the Palestinians and the Israelis. This man is only, what, like 80 years old? He ain't been on this planet this long. It's been between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Okay, maybe on paper this just started about 60, 70 years ago, but that unrest, that rivalry has been there a long time. Joe Biden can only do so much, especially when Congress is completely dysfunctional because of the Republicans. To me, this is just a person caught in between maybe his MAGA family members, and so he's sort of ended up on playing devil's advocate of kind of agreeing with MAGA sometimes and going more towards what they call a quote-unquote moderate. I can tell this is probably not a person of color because of the way they use the word woke in quotations. Um, I wish people would stop appro appropriating that word from black culture. I mean, woke was the term used to say, stay alive, don't get yourself hung. So I wish people would stop just blanketing that. But the sentiment that he said about MSNBC firing Mehdi and that being a bad move and Mark Regev being the catalyst that broke all of this forward. That I all I completely agree with everything else. Um, I would just say, guy, you know, no president is perfect. Just maybe back up off Joe Biden a little bit. And um, no, you could also just take a chill pill. So anyway, moving on, guys, I wanted to give you a little bit of... Oh, and tell me what you guys think about this Mehdi Hassan issue. Moving on, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this theory that I had. I'm not going to make this a really long one. A little bit of a touchy subject, a little bit of a pill. But I have been thinking about movies and film. And I'm someone who loves movies, guys. Like, movies or a big part of my upbringing, a big part of my growing up, my family, like I said, from a really, really big, eccentric, you know, kind of funny, kind of family. Um, my dad was a writer. He was also really into movies. My parents, they came out of those 1960s, 1970s era, um, where all the black exploitation movies were the big things, Superfly and Foxy Brown and all that stuff. Um, there was also that sort of, you know, and I, it's so crazy. We were just talking about Mehdi Hassan. Like, as far as media goes, it's like my mom literally told me yesterday, she said that they used to say back in my day, tune in, turn on, drop out. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh my God, you're so right. I used to like, I think I had like a t-shirt with that saying on a back 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 when I was like a teenager wearing tie-dye or something but that's now so real for us millennials and Gen Z is like we finally get why people in the 50s the, the hippies the black panthers and people and the ones that were saying that back in the 60s the 70s it's like okay we get it now because we're dealing with our own version of you know American communists and wannabe dictators and stuff like that so um but I have a theory. She told me that, and it, it really just got me to thinking. And movies were just such a big thing when I was young. We used to have all these VHSs and DVDs and Blu-rays. 
and our family would just literally cook dinner we would you know go outside and and you know toss around a basketball or a football for a little while maybe go back in maybe some cousins would come over maybe some aunts would come over maybe it just be the family and we would eat dinner and we would watch a movie um so i've seen a lot of movies <laughs> and i would i have to say that my my favorite era would have to be the early 2000s like oh, so good i mean what's some of the movies that i can name pineapple express knocked up i love you man if we're going even further back pootie tang the louis louis ck show back when you know before all of that stuff went down parks and recreation uh the office uh, the Wayans Brothers, Sister Sister, Moesha, the movies, we could talk about so many different things. We could literally talk about every single Eddie Murphy movie, every single Martin Lawrence movie, like uh, Rosario Dawson, um, Quentin Tarantino movies, Charmed. Like 90s, early 2000s was, for me, I feel like was millennial and gen z's era of my parents's black exploitation film eras you know my parents they had these amazing films like the black exploitation movies like the movies like the graduate even um jesus christ superstar all that good stuff but they also even had the shows like the jeffersons uh cheers all in the family um the Cosby Show, that was kind of in between, you know, sort of Gen Y. There was so much good film, music, and television that came between, you know, I would say 1965, something like that, 1965 and 1985, I don't know. And then kind of like died down and then back up again and like, no, 98 98 to 2006 2007 you know lost lost is my favorite show desperate housewives so many good things from the early 2000s but then guys stuff just seemed to drop off within the past 10 years the past decade but really really bad in the past uh three to four years i would say i remember literally the whole family getting really excited to go to the movie theater to go see something like the Transformers. Now, the old folks are probably stay behind. But me, my little cousins, my nephews, my nieces, uh, my sisters, my brothers, maybe a few aunts and stuff. I guess I got a big family, y'all. We would, This was back when people weren't afraid that any public space they go into was just going to get shot up by terrorists or somebody was going to be ass removed because of racism. You know, this was back when things weren't so... Ooh. <laughs> but we would literally all go to some opening like the Transformers or something like that. And this was back when we would see the movie in a theater. We would go and buy the DVD. We would watch it again. Somebody would learn every single line of the movie. Somebody would build the Legos Transformer, have all the video games, all the, you know, all the stuff, whatever. You know, and you would remember the lines from the movies because it was just that good. Do you know any movie? <laughs> released in the past three to four years three to four years and let's even say 10 years that you know all the lines to go on be real with me is there any movie that you know all the lines to because it was just that good that you had to watch it a few times go on i'll wait no not a one no not me either do you have any shows where you use a character's catchphrase, for instance, like, hey, the Fonz, yeah? Or, um, hey, 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 it's Fat Albert, you know? Or, what you talk about? What you talk about, Willis? Do you have any shows like that? No, because we've reached this horrible point where film is just production, you know? There's no craft in it anymore. And... The 90s and the 2000s, somebody online said something in my black online space and said something really nice. They were like, the 90s and the 2000s, early 2000s was so good for television shows because it really crafted this space between art and marketing. And it didn't take itself so seriously. 
and they talked about how shows today it seems so dramatic and theatrical like you're watching these mini movies and okay you know for instance lost like i said desperate housewives these were kind of like mini movies but it knew how to not take itself so friggin seriously it knew how to not lean completely on effects and more on just a good plot a good plot and good marketing you know look at the barbie movie that came out i haven't even seen it but i can tell you a crap ton of money was spent on that marketing as a person who t works in advertising had to be at least three mil at least I, I don't know how much but a good amount of money was spent on that marketing i mean it was everywhere influencers talking about it friggin you know, uh, banner ads, you know, everywhere you go, you see banner stuff for Barbie, you see it on YouTube, you see it, I'm pretty sure people who have uh, Spotify and things like that, they saw it there, they probably saw it on TV, everywhere, everywhere. Was Little Mermaid pushed like that? No. And I bet if it was, it probably would have got a better showing. But, it just, I don't know. It seems like the movies and shows that we're getting right now are from tired old execs who just say, hey, okay, well, this one worked. You know, I told my husband, even when we look at stuff on Netflix, sometimes Netflix's feed is so friggin' ADD. It kind of just looks like, you know, the uh, uh, higher ups or whatever were just like, oh, okay, so we see that people are really into, um, you know, uh, Japanese comics. So yeah, let's do something with that. Okay, yeah, cool, cool. Oh, oh, I'm seeing from the data that people are really into um crime. So let, let let's do a bunch of uh crime, depressing crime, depressingly violent crime documentaries. You know, it's just like okay, but eventually can we get something that's got some real thought behind it? You even think about those movies like She's All That. She saw that. I mean, it wasn't something that was um, groundbreaking, but it's iconic. Everybody remembers the stuff from that. Everybody knows that song, There She Goes, because of that, uh, I'm sorry, Kiss Me, because of that movie. Uh, the Scary Movie series. The Scary Movies. Wh wh where are those of today? And even the inspiring stuff, the Touch by the Angel, the Mask the ghost whisperer that's why we so doggone hopeless is because media is not reflecting anything in hope and it's the same thing with news because people saw hmm grievances sells so let's just keep on dishing out grievances mm, yeah very good idea but anyway i have a theory do you guys remember this one guy harvey weinstein yes i'm going there <laughs> Weinstein with his walker why did he have a walker is he I mean and that's just something that you notice the collapse of the narcissist you know you kind of see it happening with Donald Trump it looks like his face is like melting off but you know that place of power to being exposed for the horrible narcissist that they are and the collapse that ensues um and I'm and I'm sorry for this man's family I know he has children and I can't imagine how they feel, but he did some horrible things to, to women for a very, very long time. This one man essentially spun out the whole uh, Me Too movement. But when I go on Google, because Harvey Weinstein was basically canceled, right? He was basically canceled by the industry. And we could think that you know maybe that had an effect on the industry and maybe that also meant that you know while he was sort of not really focused on it he was focused on it but he was also maybe battling out whatever his trauma whatever his mental hang-ups were on abusing women namely um he probably didn't really have the time to mentor some young producers filmmakers writers creators actors um the way that he probably could have if his if his head was fully in the game and all of his movies so let's just name some Harvey Weinstein movies so let's see here we got Untouchable we got Django we got Goodwill Hunting Lord of the Rings Scream Shakespeare in Love 
Nine, Kill Bill, The Hateful Eight, Inglorious Bastards, Death Proof, one of my favorites, Kill Bill, Volume 2, Jackie Brown, The Burning, Scary Movie, Gangs of New York, Grindhouse, Scream 4, Scream 2, Scream 3, Planet Terror, Spy Kids. I love Spy Kids is one of those movies for my family. We had all the DVDs, all the VHSs, the toys, knew the lines, all that stuff. Antonio Banderas, Selma Hayek, all that stuff. Hmm, where are those movies now? <sighs> what else do we got? The King's Speech, The Butler, The English Patient. She's all that. Another Lord of the Rings, Airbud, Paddington, The Founder. Another Lord of the Rings, Ella Enchanted, one of my favorites, Scary Movie 2. A lot of good movies. But Harvey Weinstein has been canceled because of bad behavior related to sexual allegations. And ironically, the movie industry is kind of stagnated. You guys see what I'm getting at? I have an article here, Hollywood Sexual Misconduct Scandals. This is from sec September 2023. So, of course, Harvey Weinstein is one of the biggest ones. We all know about him. I'm going to skip down through some other ones. Now, in this article, there is a lot of actors, um, but I want to focus more on the big guys. I want to focus more on the big guns, the ones that have more pull, the producers, the creators. So, we have... Let's see here. Nope, more actors. More actors, lots of actors. Okay, so we have Oscar winning filmmaker Paul Haggis. Now, I gotta admit, I don't know all of these, but he was accused of sexual misconduct by four women, including two R words. Now, I'm gonna go on Google again. I'm going to ask for Paul Haggis movies. And I'm not even going to go into TV shows because uh, we might be here for quite a bit longer. But I imagine that a lot of these probably, a lot of these, these filmmakers, these producers who have sort of disappeared, have been canceled because of sexual misconduct, did a lot of the movies that we know as well. So this one, Crash, great movie. Uh, Million Dollar Baby, Casino Royale, it's a big movies, right? So who else do we got in here? So, uh, Jeff Franklin, the Full House and Fuller House creator was dropped from the Netflix series in February 2018 after a report from Variety detail complaints of alleged inappropriate behavior. So I'm imagining again, just like Weinstein, Haggis and Franklin probably didn't have too much time to train protégés, you know, and I know they definitely probably didn't have time to train protégés who look like me. You know, I would love to create films. I would love to write for films. I would love to be around films. Um, not that I've necessarily pr pursued that, but I'm pretty sure there's plenty of people just like how I concentrate on um, art and advertising and painting, you know, and writing, the, the vlogging things that I do. I'm pretty sure as passionate as I am about these things, there's some version or versions of me, young black men and women, or just men and women of every single color, but just younger, who want to be the next, not in the allegation stuff, but in the creative works, oofs that they put out, Franklin's, Haggis's, uh, Weinstein's. And that's to give them credit. These are these were amazing filmmakers. I mean, Full House, that's another one of those staples. You know, we all remember those catchphrases. We remember the characters. We remember the plots, the storylines. These were really, really oofs. These were works of art. And it was tainted by sexual misconduct, by, um, yeah, the R word, you know.
And it's horrible. It's actually horrible for me to think about it. But those protégés didn't get... They probably really didn't get... Um, they didn't come into fruition the way they should have. So Philip Burke is another one, you know, that was terrible with Brendan Fraser. Absolutely terrible. I think um, this they've got Tom Brokow in here. They've got Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby, you know, the Cosby show, I think, was known amongst the black community, the black American community, as one of the first shows that showed black people, a black family that wasn't living in the ghetto, that wasn't, you know, which that was my life. You know, I don't, my mom, my dad, my aunts, my uncles, they weren't living in the projects. Like I didn't have a mom who was fainting for crack or an aunt or whatever, you know, I didn't have like any um, people who were trapping out of the house and stuff. That wasn't my experience. So it was really weird. Um, to see that just a previous generation before me, all that was all they saw on TV. They didn't really see um, that black people could be successful, that they could be independent, they could be autonomous. I think you can probably see that a bit in the 70s, but in the 50s and 60s, it seems like that was also. They, they were less drug addled, you know, crack fiends or whatever, but they were like, like, coons you know they were like kiss ups like brown nosers you know um on a plantation but but i mean it just shows that the media has advanced but where we are right now it's all dropped right back down um stan lee you know, editor-in-chief of marvel comics haven't seen too many good marvel movies in the past 10 years and you know Marvel movies. My dad was the biggest Marvel fan. Like, biggest. He was such a freaking dork for this stuff. And I really didn't take him seriously. Sometimes he would just be dying to go to the movie to watch the latest Marvel movie. And I'd be like, Dad, I'm not into it. But I would give anything now to watch those movies with my dad. And when I look at them, they're really good movies, you know? But I haven't really been seeing too many of those superhero movies like Iron Man lately. So... Yeah, I wonder what that is. Who else do we got? We got a celebrity chef. They talk about Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman, I, I mean, I think, I don't, I don't know. There's mystery around that, but he denies allegations. I think it was like a step-granddaughter or something like that. Um, I think, I think that's it. Because I did do a quick sweep of this before. They've got some... Um, news host in here. Um, I think I did a quick sweep of this before so I would know which ones were the, um, which ones were the, um, the, the guys who were actually the creators or the producers of these films. Like I said, most of them are, um, most of them are, uh, uh, actors so this one there's another one in here so Oliver Stone and I don't really know who Oliver Stone is but I bet if I look up his movies I'm gonna know I just know that I know that name because I always hear people talking about Oliver Stone movies so let's look this one up because I'm curious to know which movies actually are his movies like I said whole family is a huge movie movie people so yeah I know his movies so we got Platoon that that is really that's really old school jfk natural born killers alexander wall street born on the fourth of july nuclear now the doors snowden jfk revisited ukraine on fire scarface <sighs> savages any given sunday heaven and earth wall street money never Sleeps, Nixon, Salvador, Midnight Express, W, U-Turn, World Center, Hand, The Hand, Talk Radio, Commandant, Conan the Barbarian, Revealing Ukraine, Ennio, South of the Border, Looking for Fidel, Seizure, Year of the Dragon, Evita, 
Greystone Park, Persona Non Grata, Freeway, The People vs. Larry Flint, Kazakh, History of the Golden Man, The Joy Luck Club, Val, Savior, Pinkville, Mi Amigo Hugo, Platoon, another platoon, 8 Million Ways to Die, Jim Brown, All American, South Central, Wall Street 3, Patriot Games, Last Year in Vietnam, and Blue Steel. A lot of Oliver Stone movies. Um, I think there was one more in here. Some more TV hosts, some rap people. I think that might be it for the creators. Louis C.K. is in here. Louis C.K. C. K. was the creator of Pootie Tang. And that's that was one of me and my dad's favorite movies. We used to laugh our butts off at that thing. Um, I was really disappointed to hear about him because I also really loved his show back in the day. I I said, how many times have I said, I think that's it, guys? I think that's it. Like I said, the most of these are um, actors. Mark Schwann, the creative One Tree Hill. I really love that show. <sighs> oh, my God. And this one was accused by Sophia Bush. And, you know, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Good Lord have mercy. And, and they talk about T.J. Miller. You know, the fact that this list is so long is really, really disheartening. Is really disheartening. That's it, guys. To wrap up, I think that um, we're coming out of a time where as Donald Trump just so eloquently said we used to grab them by the p words where that was something that was acceptable and there was no pushback and women in the industry would just accept that this is the payment that i'm going to have to render forward just to get to where it is that i'm going you know like this is the industry i can't do anything about it and that it is what it is and the me too movement was about shining a light on that it was about saying i'm a human being i have rights i'm a person i'm somebody's daughter i'm somebody's maybe mom i'm somebody's sister and i don't deserve to be used i don't deserve to be abused and um it's horrid i can't imagine what it did to these women and men you know what women and men it's not just women it's mostly women but um as i told my husband sometimes i'll be walking home and usually older white men in cars will just stop they'll just stop and be talking to me and usually I have my headphones or earplugs in or something um if even if I don't I don't engage them at all sometimes I flash my ring and just you know say you know f off or whatever but um even that right there does something to me because it hurts the soul to know that people could look at other people as objects you know <laughs> There was a story in New York I saw recently. I was talking to my mom about it. A woman, a man was trying to take his 18-year-old baby, this woman, this girl, into sex trafficking. And her mom beat this predator down three flights of stairs. I was like, you go, girl. You fight for your baby. But the fact that people could look at girls and boys, women, and men as objects like that and to know the trauma that it does to a person like that for the rest of their life um, is horrible and it's also horrible the standard that it is set for so long these people in Hollywood have who have used that um, and just pretended that nothing not just Hollywood politics corporate space all over and just pretended like oh it's just a boys club we're just playing around so let's talk about how Elon Musk is just in another flipping world, man. And I get a similar sentiment when I look at his face as how I feel when I look at Donald Trump's face. 
it just looks like you know it, I, i'd say it's sunken it looks sunken like the eyes look sunken the lips the mouth the skin looks dry and it just looks like not doing so well it's not it's not going well the protecting all the trolls and fear mongers and you know white supremacists and KKK grannies it just looks like it's not really going well for these men and protecting their billionaire cronies and their millions and billions and you know I, I don't think it's going well but anyway you guys know how I feel about Elon Musk if you don't just go and look at my other videos on him um I think he's not good for the U.S. like I understand that he's pushed innovation forward but it seems like he really is not very emotionally intelligent and believe it or not I mean a CEO at this level especially one who's dipping his hands so much within the government sector really needs to understand people I mean he doesn't understand people he only understands one set of people who's expressing all their grievances and making America a miserable place to live in and he's not even American you know um, I mean, he's American, but he's he was born in South Africa. I mean, I don't know. It just looks like a disaster waiting to happen. And you guys know how I feel about Don Lemon. We talked a little about that, a, a little bit about that earlier in the segment. Um, I was very disappointed in CNN when they let go of Don Lemon over some BS, you know, because of, I guess, what, what he said about Nikki Haley and, uh, replaced her him with the actual the woman whose face actually looks like she's sucked on a lemon um and uh Vivek Ramaswamy that that planted uh interview with Vivek Ramaswamy I'm convinced that it was pretty much that and since then I have not followed CNN I'm waiting for them to either you know bring us somebody with you know a brown minority somebody who looks like me you know somebody who looks like me man woman whatever but you know put put some representation in there anyway um i mean they had karen hunter on there at some point that had roland martin on there they kind of have a, a reputation of not giving the black voice a chance but anyway so this is an article from Yahoo News. It says Don Lemon tells Elon Musk that X replies are not necessarily fact after the tech billionaire uses them to defend his DEI stance. So I could read the article. Um, but honestly, let me just give you what I remember from looking at it. And I'm really excited to watch Don Lemon's show. I, I don't really know the specifics of where it is. I was a little bit confused on that. So once I understand exactly where it is, how I can find it, I'm definitely going to be there because I've, I've always supported him. But um, Elon Musk essentially said that you should, the same crap that people like him and Charlie Kirk have been repeating back and forth. Lies, 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 lies that say that people who are hired because of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are there, but they're less qualified. They're not there because they're less qualified. They got to present the same credentials. They got to present the same experience, the same studies, the same competencies, all of the same things, same hard skills, same soft skills, all that good stuff. Same recos, same past work histories, same trainings, same accreditations, same certifications, all the same things. It's just the companies that hire them are held accountable to show that they're showing some diversity in their hirings. Okay? That, that's what DEI is. That's what affirmative action is. Because the truth of the matter is America comes from racism. South Africa comes from slavery and apartheid. Okay? Where one race has said, we are superior we know better we do better and that's just the way it is and then the law started to change programs like DEI programs like affirmative action make sure that the government society the workforce talks the talk but also walks the walk 
any, uh, if you work in the corporate world, you guys know that any, um, you know, uh, annual report, any end of the year report, any, um, you know, PR handbook, investors handbook can say, our company toots a multicultural, diverse, and welcoming team. Anybody, any company can, can toot that. But does it really show it? Because I know that black people make up 13% of the U.S. But are 13%, is 13% of the workforce um, reflecting that? And then you might say, Nashua, oh, well, you know, not all of those 13% of people have the right certification, trade, skills, etc. Yeah, but many of them do. And they get passed up, possibly, just possibly, because of unconscious bias. And that's the emotional intelligence, the gray space that exists outside of the black and white that people like Elon Musk do not understand. And he follows conspiracy theories, rabbit holes, uh, white supremacists, trolls, and conspiracy theorists on, on Twitter, on X, and he believes them. He takes them as fact. And so Don Lemon essentially said, you, you can't take Twitter replies, tweets, for facts, you know. And Elon Musk was not happy about that. You know, the face that he gave him looked like the face your friggin' Aunt Eustace or like your Grandma Esther will give you. Like... <sighs> He just looked like he was like malfunctioning or something. Okay, the other thing, I just, there was a pay package. I can't remember how much it was. Pay package. You know, and people in the comments were talking about that he was trying to get this Tesla pay package approved. His pay package, that is. <laughs> and people in the comments were saying like, uh, from this news coverage I was watching about this, they were like, is that what rich people call their salary, a pay package? He was trying to get some $52 billion or something approved. Was it, was it $52 billion? Um, don't quote me on the number because I cannot completely remember, but it was some absurd gross amount of money. <sighs> How did we let these billionaires who used to make 100 times the salary of their average employees, just like 20, 30 years ago, go to 1,000 times the salary of their average employee. How do we get, how do we let ourselves sink into this place? It's time to dig it out. It's not right. It's not right. This corporate greed has to stop. AI, neural chips, um, any of the other stupid stuff I could think about, this is not for us. It's not to push science forward. It's the same stuff that's an Iceman inheritance. It's, it's gross greed, capitalism, materialism that's destroying the planet, destroying the human race, destroying ecosystems, destroying the earth. The earth in the process. And it's, it's just atrocious. And it's also destroying regular people's lives. People who work... 50 million times harder than a lot of these CEOs, these billionaires who are pushing these far right, conservative, insane, you know, stances, and they get paid, you know, 1,000, 2,000 times less. Um, so I thought that that pay package thing was weird. I think the, I can't remember what, um, I can't remember what authority, uh, didn't approve it they dismissed it i want to say i want to say it was someone it was an authority like the appeals court i can't remember um if i find that out we'll we'll chat about that further but i just thought that that was weird and the last thing was this neural link so apparently elon musk has this company that's creating chips yeah those kinds of chips electronic chips to insert into your brain so you can control your phone yeah that's 
that's what's happening right now you know and our planet's already being flipping destroyed because of uh companies that just have to crank out our laptops and our cars and our suvs and our washing machines okay i get it we need our stuff but dude quite literally we're about to destroy the planet ai is already i i, I think it's on one of our highest it's 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 top of mind as far as threats go it's top of mind we all saw that movie i robot right <laughs> um yeah and this dude is creating a chip to put in your mind no one asked for this it's just like i said about social media social media is a place although i understand i'm talking to you through a social media platform social media is a place of such toxicity you know and and the powers that be have made it that way they've made it so polarizing it doesn't have to be that way and it's um we never asked for this we never asked for this and i feel the same thing about elon musk's uh neural chip we never asked for this and i i cannot even begin to talk about the ethical stuff you know a a, a publicly owned company a privately owned company being able to tap into people's actual thoughts yeah that's not gonna go wrong at all so we're gonna do a bigger deeper dive into ai soon i really want to talk to you guys about this because i've been eyeing it for a while um but let's save that for later we're even going to talk about the implications on the planet that it may have we'll talk about the implications on minorities that it may have but I'm holding on to that one because it's it's a big thing. But let's get back to Don Lemon. So on Reddit, this is what some people said. Some people said, so, okay. So someone said, anyone who worked at SpaceX in the old days knows Elon is stupid. It's why SpaceX did better when he put the COO who actually, you know, knows S in charge. Elon, a good snake oil salesman, and that's it. But even that's, that has altered. You know, and, and I don't want to be mean to people. And I get the sense that the guy feels a little defensive. I get the sense that the guy is like, okay, everybody's coming after me. And I understand that. I know that this is someone's son. This is someone's father. You know, I get it. But dude, you're doing major damage. You got major power in your hands. And with great power comes great responsibility. All right. Just like Tobey Maguire said back in the early 2000s. Or nigga, the dude who played Tobey Maguire's the stepdad or wh whoever that dude was. You know what I'm talking about. With great power comes great responsibility. And it seems like you're shirking that a little bit, my friend Elon so someone says, TLDR, the headline says that all Elon tries to use replies to his ex posts as evidence to support the argument diverse pilots made the engine fall off a plane. And you know what? I've been watching the stuff with Boeing. I've been watching all of these things happening with different corporations. And it looks like total negligence. And I think to myself, you know what? I wish that they would hire some young minority people to get in there. They'd be doing much better. They'd be doing much better because you got some people out here who are really hungry. They're really committed. They got themselves together and they will work three times as hard for you because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that chance. And, um, you know, I honestly think once companies start to realize that they will capitalize on minority groups you know diversity within their company especially black uh employees within their company managers and leaders in their company but nope uh elon and trump and people of this ilk are still they were rather focused on division than unity to move forward or just Avoiding it. Elon said during this Don Lemon interview, you know the way that you solve racism? So stop talking about it. That's exactly what some out-of-touch white dude would say. No, man. No. Like, do you know that black people have to look every single day on the TV of black people being slaughtered by the police, by their neighbors, 
quite literally, by their neighbors. What was that girl, Tamla, Tamla, <sighs> Tamla, what was her last name, I can't think, Tamla, black chick at a sleepover, you know, with her, her good girlfriends, mysteriously shows up dead. That young kid who was found in a sugar plantation, just had gone on a play date with his friend and his friend's mom. Just shows up dead with gashes on his face looking unrecognizable. George Floyd, you know? And then look at the look at the the landscape of the the workforce, you know, how we try so hard, we work so hard, and uh, we're held up to higher standards, and we have to work four times as hard, and we still don't get half as many opportunities. The exact example of that was sitting right in front of Mr. Elon Musk. It's Don Lemon. So, you know, the irony, it's, it's there, and, um, you know, we'll leave that there. Moving on, I want to know what you guys think about that. Let me know in the comments. Moving on, let's talk about Jamie Foxx. I'm so glad that he's back to work. You guys know I actually just got a chance to watch uh, They Clone Tyrone. Jamie Foxx was freaking amazing in that. Everybody was amazing in that. It was so, so, so good to watch. Um, but I'm really glad to see him back. You guys know we had recently talked about this. I'm concerned that, you know, we saw Prince... Kate, Princess Kate, you know, out of Britain, we saw that she was diagnosed with cancer. Um, we know that quite a few young people have died of things like heart attacks and strokes. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of the country star's name who died recently. Um, younger people, you know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about younger people like in their 20s or 30s or whatever, but 40s, 50s are dropping down, and I'm telling you, it's. I'm telling you, it's because of the stressful time that we live in. It's really not doing us any uh, justice. Maybe it'll give us our 15 minutes of fame. But um, when I saw Jamie Foxx was not going, doing well, he was in the hospital. Um, people were saying he had to do physical therapy. People were saying that he had to regain his motor functions. I was just like, what is going on? But I also do know that the dude works extremely hard and he's a black man, a black man actor. They have to work 15 times as hard and get half as much. So it's like, I was really, really concerned because I just, I literally, I had talked to you guys on my channel about this. I sent out a call out for you guys to take care of yourself, you know, eat, eat well. You know, eat well within how you can afford it. You know, if you can buy organic, if you can buy farm raised and non GMO in uh, genetically modified, all that stuff, great. If you can't, just get those regular old veggies, eat some good lean proteins, good fats, you know, take your vitamins, exercise, do those things like meditation, swimming, basketball, running, whatever it is, you got to take care of yourself because. We live in such a stressful time. Your body is like an organ in and of itself. You know, it pumps out life and energy. But if all you're taking in is negative energy and you're not taking care of yourself, I mean, it just it's it's um and not to mention the effects of COVID. You know, I think we're going to be feeling the effects of COVID for a very long time. So. You got to take care of yourselves, guys. But this is an article from Yahoo News. It says Netflix shared the first look at Cameron Diaz and Jamie Foxx in Back in Action. And I think this is actually going to be pretty good. So Cameron Diaz is officially out of retirement and back to kicking ASS. And it feels like it's the year 2000 again. And we wouldn't have it any other way. I second that. Today, Netflix shared a sizzle reel for its upcoming 2024 releases, including Back in Action, the film that's reuniting Diaz and Jamie Foxx and tossing them away from Annie and into a heart-pounding, fast-paced action flick with a touch of family drama. Now, you guys know we just talked about, like, my theory on why film, uh, like, TV and movies is actually so bad right now. I mean, I'm sorry to say it like that, but, like, not necessarily bad, but, like, it's like a whole bunch of crap and then just like little tiny things of okay good whereas I feel like in the early 2000s there was a lot of good and then these sort of like eh, just kind of thrown in there and Cameron Diaz and Jamie Foxx they are like tokens of that time like 
late 90s early 2000s where tv movies they were like going in hard so when they say it feels like it's 2000 again and we have it we wouldn't have it any other way i'm like with them on that 2014's annie was the last time diaz was in a movie with fox of course but the two have worked together before on any given sunday yes in 1999 According to Entertainment Weekly, Diaz and Fox uh, star as Emily and Matt, respectively. They are a pair of former spies who abandoned their CIA careers to start a family together. Oh, I didn't know that they were together. Hmm, got a little interracial couple action in there. Okay. Until their cover is blown, forcing them to back into the world of espionage. That is really interesting as, you know, the uh -oh Oreo version of this kind of couple. I'm like, I'm there. That sounds good. What if mom and dad are criminals? Their daughter, who is played by McKenna Roberts, can be seen at the beginning of the clip. The fact that mom and dad get into a flight at a gas station may be a clue that they're not normal parents. They're cool spy parents. For anyone missing the vibe of Diaz from Charlie's Angels and his sequel, Charlie's Anguish Angels Full Throttle, this is exactly the thing to scratch the itch. I really like the sound of that. I really like this, guys. Okay, so she gushes about Jamie. She says she loves working with him. I love that. <laughs> so people says they note that Fox noted in August that he's finally starting to feel like myself again. I finally starting to feel like myself. And I hope he is, man. Take care of yourself. Cameron, too. Everybody, everybody just take care of yourself, you know. Don't um, let the pressures of this world, but, uh, you know, don't succumb to all the pressures of this world to be some perfect, you know, Instagram perfect model, you know, perfect mom, perfect dad, perfect student, perfect employer, perfect boss, whatever. It doesn't exist and also take those times to take care of yourself because life is short and when it's done, it's done, y'all. So take care of yourself. But I am really excited about this and I'm kind of getting vibes. What was the movie that came to my head? Spy Kids. You, you know, we came by Spy Kids earlier. I'm kind of getting vibes like that, but I don't know yet. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But Spy Kids was one of my favorite franchises because... They did. I know it's Jamie Foxx and Cameron Diaz, but they did say it's kind of a family movie, so I guess we'll see. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Are you guys excited about that? Um, on the subject of Cameron Diaz, I want to congratulate her because she just welcomed baby number two. So I have an article here from E.T. Online. It says Cameron Diaz and Benji Madden announce arrival of baby number two. The couple already shares a four-year-old daughter, Radix. Cameron Diaz and Benji Madden are growing their family. On Friday, the couple jointly took to Instagram to announce the arrival of their second child, a son named Cardinal. To share the news, Diaz and Madden posted a photo of a piece of artwork which read, A little bird whispered to me. In the caption, Madden revealed the news, which came to as a surprise, as surprise, which came to a surprise to fans, as he and Diaz hadn't previously shared that they were expecting. We are blessed and excited to uh, to announce the birth of our son, Cardinal Madden. He is awesome, and we are all so happy he is here. I love that so, God. I love that so much, guys. Like. I love that for a few reasons. Um, I I know like what the pressures of like really trying to maintain a career, and also on top of that, probably having a lot of people out there like not necessarily rooting for your success. You know, Cameron Diaz is a very sweet person, but you would be surprised. Look at Meghan Markle; she's also a sweet person, but people have really wanted to see this woman you know not succeed so for a long time I was really worried about Cameron Diaz I really wanted to see her settle down with someone who really loves her with the love language with the way that she deserves and it seems like Benji really does that you know I love the fact that she married kind of like a rocker I really used to listen to a lot of his stuff back in the day um it's it's really great and I also, the other thing that was 
notable to me is the fact that she is an older mom because if you think about Janet Jackson you think about Tyra Banks uh, similar boats not necessarily the same types of artists or uh, actors or performers however you want to call it but that that desire to want to be a mom does not go away and you know, it goes all the way back to biblical times. It all it goes all the way back to our prehistoric uh, ancestors. That's why you saw things like fertility goddesses everywhere. You know, women are the progenitors of the human race, but sometimes women have fertility issues. Sometimes women get married late, you know, and all types of things happen, but sometimes you get those miracle babies, right? And I was a miracle baby because my mom had me when she was 40. So, like, thank goodness for all those miracle babies. Not to make this about me, but just all the miracle babies in the world. Babies born to those older moms. Babies born when there is fertility issues. I love it. I love it. I love it. Congratulations, Cameron Diaz. You guys, Benji, Cameron, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good luck. And I will be following to see like how mom life of two is going for them. So you guys let me know what you think in the comments. And moving on to wrap up, I wanted to talk about how I feel like Biden and Harris are kicking butt. I wanted to highlight a few things and I'm only going to be able to kind of highlight them quickly because uh, we've gone a little while here so I'll probably have to come back and talk to you in a little bit more in depth at a later date. Um, but there's been a few things over the last couple of months um, that really have been striking me as brave, been striking me as um, resilient in the face of the different financial struggles that not financial but economic challenges of this administration um obviously donald trump the, the 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 challenge in and of itself that donald trump and maga um republicans are and uh the different wars that i mean are kind of out of biden's control i mean i know that he has a certain amount of control but he didn't start the war in ukraine he didn't start the war in israel you know it's like he didn't start the war in Benin or Niger or uh, 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 Haiti, you know, however you want to look at it. So there's a few things. Uh, there was um, a tour in the White House with Architectural Digest. With Architectural Digest. There was... Um, <sighs> A speech where he calls Donald Trump a loser and I know that just sounds like that's kind of crass or whatever but I want to get into why I thought that that was really noteworthy he really really went in on that speech and he also made it about his constituents he had these workers up there with him um, no that wasn't that speech I'm sorry but every speech he really really puts out there the everyday working man you even see when he's going out to greet and meet and greet with different people he's really really showing that he's there for his constituents especially the people who work for him within congress within city councils within um you know local government with the general assembly within congress he's really really showing that and people don't give him credit for that he's had a lot of experience with that and when we're looking at him and donald trump we're looking at apples and oranges it's just the epitome of apples and oranges the other thing was his State of the Union address. This was amazing, even despite MAGA Mike, Mike Johnson throwing weird looks behind him. Um, he just looked like, you know, that that meme of Kevin Hart, you know. <laughs> you know that face that I'm talking about, the Kevin Hart face, uh, while Kamala Harris is like getting up clapping. Marjorie Taylor Greene is in the audience dressed in all this MAGA attire looking crazy but you know just how embraced he was there and even how despite the sort of like begrudging uh, sort of hesitation from Republicans and even the sort of who we assume are the far right Republicans on the Supreme Court I mean we don't assume it we know who they are um, even they seemed inclined to be drawn to Biden because he is a good egg. He's he's a good egg. He has a good soul. 
maybe he's not perfect, but he's not a dictator, right? He's not evil. He's not a rampant uh, R word. You know what I'm talking about? He's not a misogynist. He's not a criminal. Um, and that right there was, it was noteworthy. The last thing um, was, Kamala Harris and Kamala Harris she talked about um Roe v. Wade right she talked about Donald Trump talking about Roe v. Wade and tooting that he ended abortion you know something that our European allies are just it's a given for most of them it's a given it's like you know how, how dare I feel like I can just go ahead and tell somebody what to do about their life? You know, this is 2024. This is not prehistoric times. This is not arcane times. This is not the Salem witch trials. You have no business trying to tell people how they should, you know, um, look after their family. You know, how they should expand or not expand their family. How they should not take care of their bodies. How they should look at their health care no business and Kamala Harris said how dare he you know so that's what I want to look at there was architectural digest Biden brought us into the White House millions of viewers and I thought that was noteworthy I also like how Biden is quite active on Twitter at good times I know he's probably working with some sort of PR manager or something on his Twitter but I think that he is driving the will on that and he is right on it. You know, Donald Trump and his criminal stuff, he just drops these kind of cheeky remarks. Um, so let's look at this. First of all, the Architectural Digest, I really liked the down-to-earth element of him bringing us into the White House. I don't know that I've seen anything quite like it, but it could just be that I haven't seen anything like this in my lifetime. I do know that there probably be, have been presidents who have done this before. I've definitely seen the White House and other coverage and things like that. And I want to say that I remember Obama. I remember seeing maybe something similar during the Obama administration. But don't hold me to that. But it definitely wasn't this in-depth. And he goes through art pieces. He goes through photos. He goes through some of his own little kind of knickknacks and things. He talks a little bit about the design and the history of the building, the history of some of the artifacts within the building. And it really, <laughs> it puts into place how much respect he has for this position. And that's something that you guys really need to think and keep in mind. Vote blue down the line in 2024. Um, he actually really values this position. He looks at the um, high importance of this position and how he's, He's a spokesperson, a representative for every American person, not just rich white ones or, you know, even rural white ones or just white ones, but all Americans. And, and he takes it really, really seriously. But I wanted to quote, um, I can't remember the guy's name. He's featured on MSNBC a lot. He's like short, kind of a short black man and he's got like long, big, white, like kind of gray white hair. Kind of like Albert Einstein is just like popped up in a like big kind of almost I, I have no idea anyway I wish I could remember his name I'm so sorry that I can't but he said something interesting I think he was on the Roland Martin show and he was like Republicans are he's no no he said Democrats are playing chess Democrats are playing chess but it doesn't make he, he said something like it doesn't it doesn't matter if Democrats are playing chess if Republicans are just taking that chessboard and beating you over the head with it. And I was like, that's it right there. It, it's an understatement to say that Republicans and Democrats are apples and oranges. You know, like Democrats are playing a safe game. They're playing the game as it should be played. It's, it's traditional politics, you know, being considerate of others, the way that they say things, being politically correct trying to follow policy, trying to follow tradition, trying to um, say things with a candor of respect, trying to, you know, get with their constituents and come up with compromises while Republicans are being authoritarian, uh, dictatorial, 
Um, they are conspiracy theorists. They are grievance politics. They are cancel culture. They are bigoted, racist, sexist, you know, voter suppression. So it's like they're coming at every angle. And you can tell that they know that this is, they're going to lose. Because why would it be so bogged down and negative and hate filled if they didn't, you know? And I hope that there are people out there who realize that this is a cult. It's time for you to get out. Vote blue down the line. You know, it's a cult. You come back to us we want you to come back and make it right with your family and you can re you can vote republican in the future but take the time to weed out the bad eggs the dictators the authoritarians the white supremacists the conspiracy theorists um and repair your party and then you can come back so it says let's be clear about the 2020 election Trump exhausted every legal avenue available to him to overturn the election, everyone. But the legal path just took Trump back to the truth that I'd won the election and he was a loser. It's powerful. He had one act left, one desperate act available to him. The violence of January the 6th, and oh yes, it was violent. Since that day, more than 1,200 people have been charged with assault on the Capitol. Nearly 900 of them have been convicted or pled guilty. Collectively to date, they have been uh, sentenced to more than 840 years of prison. Was Trump done? Instead of calling them criminals, he's called these insurrectionists patriots. They're patriots. I think the choice is clear, guys. You've got an authoritarian, horrid, horrid man whose face is melting off because this is the most, the biggest example I think we've ever seen, the most public example we've ever seen of what they call narcissistic collapse. Ever. You know, ever. It's literally Scooby-Doo episodes of them finally taking the, the friggin' bed sheet off of the dude faking to be a ghost. It's horrid and he has no business being in the White House and I feel like deep down you guys out there who are still beating the MAGA drum know that you know better than this so here is Vogue is the five key moments from President Biden's 2024 State of the Union address I get if you don't think that Biden and Harris are perfect no president is perfect but like Biden said don't compare me to the Almighty compare me to the alternative. President Joe Biden presented Congress with his fourth State of the Union address on Thursday night, one that was clearly crafted to separate him as firmly as possible from his presumptive opponent in his year's election, former President Donald Trump. So here are the five things. Trump was derided, of course. Abortion was centered, finally. The Biden administration's call for a temporary ceasefire was renewed. Biden took a hard stance on Ukraine and voting rights were emphasized. Now read deeper into the lines of this. So the five key moments. Trump was derided of course. Everybody knows life has been hard in the Western world. You know Donald Trump has been a thorn in the side of the Western world. The whole world for about 10 years now. We're all exhausted, okay? And he's highlighting that. Abortion was centered. Those of you out there, a lot of liberal, mostly, a, a lot of liberal white women actually who I'm seeing protesting a lot around abortion. I know who you are. I mean, you are maybe a mom who's already got three or four kids or five or six kids and it's not time for more kids. You are a working professional and you want to focus on your career. You are a, an older mom and you don't think that you have the capacity to have any more children. You are simply a person who wants to see 
a right that has been here for so long. I mean, separation between church and state was created for a reason. And you want to see this right to be able to be passed down to your children and their children. You are someone who has health issues. You know, it could be dangerous for you to get pregnant. You are someone uh, who is a college student. Maybe you don't have much experience in the world because you're quite young and you don't want to have a child yet. Maybe you're not even a college student. Uh, maybe you are a teenager, you know, who has gotten pregnant and you want to do more. You want to experience more before you have a family and you shouldn't have to be making excuses for that. So the fact that that's highlighted in there is really big. The fact that Ukraine is highlighted in there is really big because Putin put out this freaking press release that, not, not a press release, but he put out the statement that he would support Biden, you know, over Trump if he could, because he thinks that Biden is a stronger leader. You know, that just shows the ickiness of that nature. I mean, here Donald Trump is always up Putin's booty, you know, like there are two dictatorial Hitler wannabes just in the playpen together having a little play date and his best friend has basically said your opponent would be better than you and of course it's all a political new move because Putin knows he's done so much wrong he's done so much wrong and Biden is the type of leader who is not going to excuse totalitarianism he's not going to excuse this authoritative just violence political violence you know hundreds of thousands of people dying under this man you know and ukraine we keep forgetting about it because we're so distracted by this crap that donald trump and the MAGA republicans are doing and biden basically reminds us we cannot forget about this you know we can't forget about this the ceasefire in Gaza. Um, Biden knows, he knows that he's been losing support amongst uh, Arabic speaking Americans, amongst Muslim Americans, amongst Palestinians, and amongst young people. And he knows that, but it's not just about that. It comes back to treaties and alliances that are decades long, that are uh, goes back to histories that are centuries long. And he knows that he's walking a tight rope because there is an allyship between America and Israel. And if you just look at this in black and white rose tinted glasses thinking, well, he's the president. He should just do it. You know, that's quite naive to think of. He He's he's doing what his predecessors, what the U.S. Constitution and what our commitment to our allies, to our commitments as far as fiscal commitments have defined around the world, you know? Sometimes you don't always get to do what you wanna do. It's the same thing of Biden is surrounded by advisors because yes, he's the president. He has quite a lot of power, but at the same time, this is a big machine comprised of the executive, the legislative and the judicial branch, you know? Biden was a senator for a very long time. He understands foreign policy and He's walking a tightrope, but at the same time, he knows Netanyahu, Netanyahu is an idiot. He's an idiot and he's taking so many lies mercilessly. And um, I think he's been caught in a rock, between a rock and a hard place, but him talking about that ceasefire is important. Ukraine and Israel, they're two of the most important things that need to be funded by America right now. Our European allies have already gave so much money. You know, America has a lot of money. I mean, if you're looking at two billion, three billion, and you're thinking it's a whole lot of money, America has a lot of money. And you know who, who gives them that money? It's us. We pay our taxes. We put in a lot of work. And you know what? When we have good relationships around the world, diplomacy, it comes back to us because we're not being bombed every two seconds. So uh, I hate to put it that way, but yeah, it puts Netanyahu and Hamas, they have no right to be going back and forth with each other like that. I think the U.S. doesn't want to end up in another uh, Afghanistan 
Iraq type situation. And that's why it's kind of been, let us give you arms, but let us stay hands off. But I think during the State of the Union, Biden mentioning this and making it clear to Congress, you need to approve Israel and Ukraine aid was crucial. It's crucial. But at the same time, him also saying there needs to be a ceasefire. That's saying you need to approve this aid so that uh, yeah, innocent people can stop dying. But at the same time, you, I, I will, I will work to make sure that less innocent Israelis and Gazans, uh, Israelis and Palestinians, stop dying in Gaza. And um, lastly, the voting rights issue. The voting rights issue is kind of. It's, it really hits home for me because I'm a person of color. I come from a very red state. I was born in Alabama. I, I know I live in France, but I'm still American. I was born in Alabama and I grew up in Georgia. And these, I mean, Georgia turned purple recently, but historically have been very red states. And um, historically, states like that really want to suppress Black votes. They don't want Black people voting. They don't want black people voting because they know they will gear towards Democratic. And the Democratic Party is generally more progressive, more liberal, more centrist. And these billionaires, the gun lobbyists, the fast food lobbyists, the, the anti-abortion people, they don't want you getting those, uh, advocating for those laws that make us a little bit closer, that close that wage gap more. They want to keep the rich rich and the poor, poor, as many would say it. And um, for him to speak on voting rights, vote the, the, the very clear voting suppression that's happening around black people, around Latino people, around LGBTQ people, around veterans, um, around disabled people, around women, is very, very, very clear. And the fact that Biden mentions it that that tells you who should be on your ticket for 2024. Donald Trump won't even admit that this voter suppression is happening, you know, so that right there should forfeit his stake on the ticket. Um, Kamala Harris, as usual, saying how dare he. She's she's always been a very, very loud spoken but soft-spoken, if you know what I mean, opinionated, eloquently speaking, uh, eloquent speaking, um, intelligent, experienced woman. And I think that she would be an amazing president, you know? I think she would be an amazing vice president. If anything ever happened to Biden, she would be an amazing president. And people would hate her for it, but it would be a step forward for the U.S. You know, it's recently like the um, president of Liberia said, she said, I was, I'm surprised that the U.S. hasn't had, had a female president yet. Um, if you really actually really look at the way the crowd interacts with her, they really, really feel connected to her. Um, and Obama had that same energy. So, and, and, the abortion thing, the suppression of women votes, the suppression of women's health care rights. She's going to keep pushing for that. She'll always be there for that. And that's really, really, really important. You know, I, motherhood is so important. It's it's fulfilling, but it's also something that's very personal. And you should have the rights to address it the way that you want. And so um, it was really it was really um, notable, noteworthy, her being there. It was noteworthy, her talking about these issues that are hitting women. You're seeing so many women protesting about those issues. And it was also just sort of like refreshing, you know, refreshing to see someone who reminds you of your mom or your sister or your aunt, you know, who could be the president? I mean, who would be better to help organize this mess of the U.S. than a woman? You know, that's what women do. We organize messes. Um, but I loved it. I think that they are killing it. 
And I know there's going to be people, they're going to be, you know, critics or whatever, but, you know, decide it in the, in the ballot, you know, don't decide it with your fists or anything like that. We can absolutely exist in a fair democracy where you decide with your ballot. So I encourage you all to get out there and vote, vote for your choice. But I encourage you to vote blue all the way down the line in 2024, because voting for blue is voting for democracy. But if you want to stumble into 1941 hit uh you know hitler's 1941 germany then vote republican you know but i think you would regret it and i think your children and your children's children will, would, would regret it um but anyway we talked about a whole lot today guys i want to know what you think let me know in the comments if you're new here please hit the like subscribe button hit the bell so you know whenever i post a video um you can also send me a super chat you can send me a super thanks if you would like to support this channel it helps pay for all of our gear all of our uh setup our studio setup it helps us pay for the software things that we need um and it helps push these videos out into the world and so we're growing this little community and i'm so happy you're here i love you for the unique things that make you you and i'm so happy that you're here with me thank you so so much for your support guys Truly, sincerely, I may not always get back to the comments as fast as I would like, um, but sincerely, I, I the love is there. The love is there. So thank you so much for your support. Will you dare to love? Check out my book, Millennial and Gen Z Guide to Marriage, Love in the Age of Lies, Deception, and Mistrust. Peer to peer, I will journey with you in the pitfalls, love, laughter, and even in the pains that come with marriage. Despite the bad PR, I believe our generations shouldn't give up on love just yet. This book will make you look at millennial and Gen Z marriage, life, and love with a refreshing new lens. This is our time. Compared to baby boomers and Gen Xers, millennials and Gen Z are getting married less, buying homes later, and suffering poverty more. Whether you've got a bit of hope or you need some hope desperately, here are all the tips and tricks taken from my own experience in my own millennial marriage. You'll grow in love and happiness when you apply them across marriage, other relationships, your career, health, and every aspect of your life. Millennial and Gen Z Guide to Marriage, Love in the Age of Lies, Deception, and Mistrust is available now on Amazon. I'm so happy you're on this journey with me. Let's get started. Order your copy today.